now a hearing on spending for federal drug control programs. The House Government Reform Subcommittee heard from National Drug Control Policy Director John Walters. It's about three hours. Subcommittee will now come to order. Good afternoon, and we thank you all for coming. Today we are holding our subcommittee's first official hearing of the 109th Congress. We uh, did one as uh, part of the full committee uh, uh, last week on uh, prison reentry, but this is the first official uh, subcommittee hearing as we've just reorganized and received our uh, member notifications uh, yesterday when the uh, House uh, Government Reform Committee organized and uh, announced the subcommittee assignments. It's very appropriate that our topic is the federal drug budget, the money that the U.S. government spends to reduce drug abuse, whether through law enforcement, drug treatment, or drug use prevention. Since its creation, this subcommittee's primary mission has been to oversee all aspects of the federal government's approach to the drug abuse problem. This hearing will go to the heart of that mission. When evaluating drug control policies, we must always apply one simple test. Do the policies reduce illegal drug use? That is the ultimate performance measure for any drug control policy, whether it is related to enforcement, treatment, or prevention. And if we apply that test, the Bush administration is doing very well. Drug use, particularly among young people, is down since President Bush took office in 2001. Under this administration, we have seen an 11 percent reduction in drug use. And over the past three years, there has been a historic 17 percent decrease in teenage drug use. That is in stark contrast to what happened in the mid to late 1990s when drug use, particularly among teenagers, rose dramatically after major declines in the 1980s and the early 1990s. These statistics show that the policies pursued by this administration and the Congress are working. The combination of tough and vigorous law enforcement, treatment for those suffering from drug addiction, and no-nonsense drug abuse prevention and education programs has yielded significant positive results. Our goal is to continue and build upon that success by identifying which specific policies are working best and which ones could use improvement and which ones are not working. The President submitted his overall budget request on Monday. Over the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, has not yet issued its annual drug budget summary or its annual national drug control strategy. Our review of the overall budget proposal reveals the outlines of the President's drug policy priorities. First, the President is proposing a significant boost to federal law enforcement and drug interdiction operations. I support that increase. Without a credible deterrent to trafficking, the supply of drugs will simply overwhelm our other programs. Treatment and prevention will not work if drugs are not only plentiful and cheap, but there is no legal penalty or social stigma attached to their stale sale and use. The President's boost to federal law enforcement agencies, however, is accompanied by a substantial proposed reduction in federal assistance to state and local law enforcement. The administration is asking Congress to eliminate funding for the burn grant programs, to cut out funding for the methamphetamine hotspots grant program by over 60 percent, and to cut funding for the high-intensity drug trafficking areas, HIDAs, it, that program by more than 50 percent. The HIDA program budget cuts would be accompanied by a transfer of the remaining HIDA funds to the Justice Department's Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, OSADEF, effectively terminating the program as it currently exists. These cuts would certainly have a very dramatic impact on drug enforcement at the state and local level, at least in the short term. I am also concerned that the damage to federal, state, and local law enforcement cooperation would be even more long-lasting. Most drug enforcement takes place at the state and local level, not at the federal level. We need to be very sure that we continue to treat state and local agencies as partners in this effort. Secondly, the President is proposing modest increases in drug treatment programs from their currently appropriated levels. I welcome these increases, and I believe that this administration is taking positive steps to improve the performance and accountability of treatment programs. Without effective performance evaluation, it will be impossible for Congress and the public to judge whether various treatment programs are worth the substantial investment they require. I am particularly encouraged by the administration's continuing commitment to its groundbreaking Access to Recovery initiative, which seeks to increase the availability of drug treatment services and to give patients greater control over the kind of service they receive. Third, the President is proposing deep cuts or level funding for many of our major drug use prevention programs. 
the administration is specifically asking for the elimination of the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Program and the level funding of the Drug-Free Communities Program and level funding of the National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign. I have serious concerns about this. It is true that many prevention programs, particularly the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Program, have had difficulty maintaining an anti-drug focus and demonstrating results in terms of reducing drug use. However, terminating them outright or refusing to fully fund them sends the message that the federal government is backing away from prevention. Reducing demand is a crucial element of drug control policy. Rather than terminate prevention programs, we should look for ways to improve them by forcing them to measure their real impact on drug use. The media campaign, for example, has already done this. Its studies show that the advertising is reaching its intended audience and increasing their perception of the harms of drug use. The resulting reduction in youth drug use is the ultimate measure of success. In addition to our discussion of the budget, we will also be addressing the role and the future of ONDCP itself. ONDCP, which was established in 1989, is intended to act as the principal advisor to the President on drug control issues and to coordinate all aspects of the Federal Government's drug control policies. I have ongoing concerns, however, about how much impact ONDCP is having on the administration's policy. For example, ONDCP appears to have been largely absent in the ongoing debate over how to address the rapid expansion of Afghan opium production since the fall of the Taliban in 2001. Many of my colleagues and I have been very disappointed in the failure of the Defense Department to take effective action against the heroin traffic in Afghanistan. We are now also worried about the State Department's commitment to this program. ONDCP needs to take a more visible and active role in bringing the Defense Department and the other agencies together to craft a workable, effective anti-heroin strategy in Afghanistan. We plan to address these and many other issues today as we begin the budget process and our work on the reauthorization of ONDCP and its programs this year. We thank our principal witness, Director John Walters of ONDCP, for agreeing to come and testify today. We also welcome Professor Peter Reuter, a former drug policy advisor to the Clinton administration, whose testimony was requested by the minority. We thank everyone for taking time to join us and look forward to your testimony. Let me do a couple of procedural uh, matters before moving ahead. Before proceeding, I would like to take care of uh, several of these procedural matters. First, since this hearing was originally scheduled as a full committee hearing, I ask NAS consent that all committee members of the full government forum committee present be permitted to participate. I ask uh, unanimous consent, uh, uh, hearing no objections so ordered. I also ask uh, unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Without objection, it's so ordered. I also, also ask and ask consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, and that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection, it is so ordered. Uh, we've been joined on, uh, as members uh, make their way over uh, from the, the vote, I went ahead and uh, did my opening statement. Uh, so we could get rolling since we were 35 minutes uh, behind. Um, let me first introduce the other uh, two new Republicans on our side. Uh, uh, before we go to you for an opening statement, you can catch your breath. Been joined by our new subcommittee uh, vice chairman, Mr. McHenry of, of North Carolina, and also by uh, 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 Ms. Brathwaite from Florida. Brownweight, I said, uh, excuse me. Brownweight from the uh, 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 west side of uh, Florida, and we appreciate your participation in today's hearing uh, as well. Uh, now yield to Ranking Member Mr. Cummings for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, and uh, certainly we welcome Mr. Higgins to our side uh, of the table. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this uh, very important hearing on the President's proposed drug budget for fiscal year 2006. I'd like to extend an appreciative welcome to our two distinguished witnesses, the Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and Principal Advisor to the President on Drug Policy, John Walters, and certainly to Dr. Peter Reuter, the founder and former director of the RAND Drug Policy Research Center and now Professor of Public Affairs in criminology in the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. As we meet today to discuss the President's proposals for federal drug control programs, 
and the process by which the Federal drug budget is formulated and defined. Drug abuse, addiction, and a corrosive and often violent drug economy continue to ravage communities throughout the nation. These communities are urban, rural, and suburban, rich, middle class, and poor. And the drug threats they face vary greatly along geographical and demographic lines. It is clear that disadvantaged populations in our nation's cities are disproportionately affected, however, and nowhere in America are the tragic consequences of drug abuse and drug violence more evident than in my own city of Baltimore, including the neighborhood I call home. It was just today in the Sun paper uh, the Federal prosecutors took over a state case where a woman had been firebombed out of her house because she decided to cooperate with the police with regard to some drug activity. Uh, and and uh, Director Walters, you will recall, we dealt with the Dawson case and uh, where seven people were incinerated uh, to death because they simply wanted to cooperate with the police with regard to drug activity. And so uh, we see it upfront and personal in the 7th Congressional District of Maryland. The Office of National Drug Control Policy plays an important role in shaping our nation's response to the drug problem. And I am thankful to Director Walters for demonstrating his concern and compassion for the plight of my neighbors in Baltimore City. And I will say it, Mr. Chairman, that, and say it to the world, I think, I think uh, John Walters has done an outstanding job. He has been fair. I've never felt one, one moment of uh, partisanship. I feel that you deal with things in a very professional way, and I'm glad that you are where you are. Because the drug problem is so multifaceted, the agencies that address various aspects are located throughout the government. ONDCP, ONDCP was created in 1988 for the primary purpose of coordinating drug control policy making among these various agencies. The ONDCP's director's authority to certify the budgets of the agencies that perform drug control functions is among the statutory tools that ONDCP has at its disposal to ensure that those budgets reflect and advance the President's priorities and goals in the area of drug control. The director also oversees the formulation of the National Drug Control Strategy which places the drug budget requests and policy objectives in a narrative framework and evaluates the effectiveness of drug control initiatives for the prior fiscal year. Beginning in fiscal year 2004, ONDCP undertook a restructuring of the federal drug budget that affects what costs and functions are included in the collection of agency budgets that we call the drug budget for purposes of formulating and evaluating policy. We will look at the implications of that restructuring today, in addition to looking at the drug budget itself. Although we have yet to see either the President's 205 strategy, 2005 strategy, or a detailed accounting of the federal drug budget, the proposed funding for all federal agencies involved in drug control is set forth in the overall budget request submitted to Congress this week. From that, we can draw some conclusions. The FY 2006 drug budget is more heavily weighted towards supply reduction than to demand reduction, and to a greater extent than in years past. The FYI 2006 budget allocates approximately 39 percent of drug control funding to demand reduction versus 45 percent in fiscal year 2005. 61 percent of the drug control spending is devoted to supply reduction activity, much of it based in source countries. The total of $4.8 billion allocated for demand reduction in FY 2006 is not just a smaller percentage of the drug budget. It, is also, it also represents a net reduction of about $270 million compared to the level appropriated by Congress in FY 2005. The most severe program cut in the area of prevention is the elimination of $441 million in funding for grants to states under the Safe and Drug-Free Schools Program within the Department of Justice. And the consequences will be felt in classrooms across the country where states cannot fund drug education on their own. The Drug-Free Communities Grant Program is funded at $10 million 
below the authorized level and the budget of the new Community Coalition Institute is slashed by more than one half. In the area of treatment, there are substantial increases for drug courts and the Residential Substance Abuse Treatment Program. But the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, the backbone of the nation's drug treatment infrastructure, and the Targeted Capacity Expansion Grants are merely level funded. Within the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, only the Presence Access to Recovery Voucher Initiative, a new program that serves only 14 states currently, receives a significant increase. With regard to domestic law enforcement, the present budget increases support for the Drug Enforcement Administration, but proposes not only to cut the HIDA program by more than $128 million, more than half its FY 2005 budget, but also to move it to the Department of Justice. This would sharply curtail joint anti-drug efforts by federal, state, and local law enforcement and change the flexible nature of the HIDA program that makes it so effective and valuable in the Baltimore, Washington region and elsewhere. At the same time, we are increasing funding for supply reduction activities that have yet to fulfill their purpose of affecting the price, purity, and availability of dangerous illicit drugs like cocaine and heroin in the United States. Although marijuana use among 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students has dropped significantly, according to the December 2004 Monitoring the Future survey, the very same survey shows use of cocaine and heroin increasing in the same population subgroup. Thus, while the data allows the President to claim victory in meeting his goal of reducing overall drug use by 10 percent over two years, there is a disturbing trend going on with regard to cocaine and heroin, and our nation's drug policy must be responsive to it. Mr. Chairman, the significant shifts in drug control funding priorities at the beginning of the President's second term will be attributed in part to the deficit. But the apparent de emphasis of demand reduction is disconnecting even that context, even in that context. The deficit has many effects, but eliminating the unmet need for treatment capacity is not one of them. I'm also troubled by what drug policy experts outside the administration believe is a rather arbitrary approach to deciding what agencies and functions are included in or omitted from the restructured drug budget. Both these developments concerning the drug budget raise questions about how NDCP's statutory authorities are being exercised and we should address today and in the coming months. I'm really looking forward uh, to a healthy discussion among our colleagues and our distinguished witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. Ms. brown -White, do you have any opening comments you'd like to make? No, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any uh, opening comments. I accept to say that I recently sat in, um, in, in a teen uh, court, and if you don't think that the drug problem is very pervasive among teens and very young teens, then uh, I think we're uh, deluding ourselves. And, you know, I, I look forward to hearing the rest, uh, to, to hearing the testimony today so that we can um, have a better handle on where this money is going and the efficacy of it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Higgins? No, no thank you. Thank you for joining the committee. Yes. Look forward to working with you. Uh, Ms. Fox is another new member from North Carolina. Do you have any opening comments? Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, Director Walters, you know our uh, routine in the government reform, and we need to swear you in as a witness. Do you swear the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness responded in affirmative. Thank you again for your leadership in this uh, very difficult uh, subject where we uh, constantly work at the uh, trials, and uh, hopefully we can make little progress year by year, but it is a never-ending problem. We thank you for your leadership, and thank you for again coming before our committee. I look forward to your testimony. We need to. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, Ranking Member Cummings, who I've had the pleasure to work with over the number of years I've been uh, director of this office. Um, uh, I don't look at my job as a hard job. I look at my job as a as a remarkably uh, uh, beneficial gift to work on something you care about. And I know many of you see that your service to the country in the same way. 
and I'm pleased at the opportunity to work with many of you who have uh, uh, given so much and uh, uh, allow us to be more effective in what we do with the executive branch programs that we fund. I appear before you today, as you mentioned, to discuss the fiscal 2006 National Drug Control budget. Later this month, in a couple of weeks, we'll release the updated uh, National Drug Control Strategy detailing the policies and programs that are part of the fiscal 2006 budget. I appreciate this committee's longstanding support for the President's budget and strategy, and I'm pleased to report that that partnership, as you mentioned, has produced historic declines in youth drug use between 2001 and 2004, a 17 percent decline nationwide. We recognize that in some areas that uh, decline has been uh, greater. In some areas the problem has gotten worse, and in some areas it hasn't gotten better. Uh, we do not intend by that uh, number to suggest there isn't more to do. You know that and we know that. Indeed, our policy and strategy, our budget, is designed to capitalize on what we've learned over 30 years of struggling with this problem and is based on the President's direction that our job is to make that problem smaller as rapidly as we possibly can. With Congress's support and the President's fiscal 2006 budget, we think key programs such as the Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign and others uh, in prevention and other areas of the budget, as us with insight of reaching the President's goal of a five-year reduction in drug use of 25 percent. My written dis testimony discusses the programs across the executive branch in some detail. I'd like to ask at this point that it be included in the record, and I'll just touch on a couple of points, if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Just as an overview, <clears throat> the 2006 budget provides significant resources to reduce the problem of illegal drug use. In total, the National Drug Control budget for 2006 is $12,400,000,000, million, an increase of over $270 million, of almost $270 million, or 2.2 percent, for fiscal year uh, 2005, over fiscal year 2005. In a fiscal year when discretionary spending is essentially frozen, drug control dollars have increased, and in a time when the country is at war, performance and effectiveness matter, as you as well as I know. State of the Union, the, as the President said in his, his budget, it substantially reduces or eliminates over 150 pro, pro, government programs that are not getting results or duplicate current efforts or do not fulfill essential priorities. The principle here is clear. Taxpayer dollars must, not be, spent, must be spent wisely or not at all. I think we can all agree on that point. In terms of highlights of the drug control budget, I'll just summarize a couple here and then take questions and follow areas that you have particular interest in. In continuing the programs that we know, we, we know work, the budget of HHS, Education and ONDCP include funding to support an import, important prevention efforts. Almost 40 percent of the drug budget, as you mentioned, is for drug treatment and prevention. At the Department of Health and Human Services, the FY06 budget proposes $150 million for access to recovery, a $50.8 million uh, request above the 05 enacted level for additional treatment resources. At the Department of Education, the 06 budget proposes $25.4 million for student drug testing programs, an increase of $15.4 million over the 05 enacted level. At ONDCP, the 06 budget proposes $120 million for the youth anti-drug media campaign, which is consistent with the enacted level for the current fiscal year. Funding for supply reduction in the Departments of Homeland Security, Justice, State, Treasury and Defense will support operations targeting the economic basis of the drug trade, domestic and international sources of illegal drugs, and trafficking routes to and within the United States. This is the remaining 60 percent of the drug budget as apportioned among law enforcement international programs, intelligence spending and interdiction activities. Program areas have recently expanded, as you know, to, to combat heroin production in Afghanistan. At the Department of Justice, an additional $22 million is requested for DEA in Central and Southwest Asian operations. In addition, the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force uh, FY06 request includes almost $662 million for the Department of Justice, over $44 million for the Department of Homeland Security, and $55.6 million for the Department of Treasury. At State, the 06 budget retain, remains committed to our allies in the Western Hemisphere by proposing $734.5 million for the Andean Counter Drug Initiative. And in supporting the flourishing democracy in Afghanistan, the budget proposes $188 million for counter-narcotics programs in that country. 
In conclusion, I look forward again to working with the committee as we have in the past and the entire Congress to implement the policies and programs called for in the FY06 budget of the President. Um, what we are proposing, we believe, will yield continued success. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cummings, for uh, the opportunity to appear before you today and to members of the committee. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Walters, Director Walters, Mr. Czar, as a, as a colloquial I spent call. a lot of time telling school kids there are no czars in America, and there's a lot of people who died to make sure there never will be. So. <laughs> right. Thank you. The, uh, I have, I have uh, many questions today, but let me start with kind of a uh, general concern about some of the smaller programs within ONDCP that I believe are indicative of a larger concern that I have and many other members have with the budget proposal that is coming towards us. And I'm going to roll several things together. Uh, these things are going to be, for the most part, pretty familiar with inside your department. And I would then like you to respond because uh, collectively these raise the specter to me of what happened under the Clinton administration when he first became president. They basically gutted the drug czar's office. It was in one quick swoop from 120 staff down to 20 staff, and we watch drug use soar in the United States, and we're still trying to catch back up. Now, let me illustrate a couple of things. The administration requested $2 million less, basically a 10 percent cut, in your own budget for administration in the office of ONDCP. You also have positions for Administrator of Drug-Free Communities Program, which is acting, Chief Scientist position in the Counter Drug Technology Assessment Center, which is acting, the Deputy Director of Supply Reduction, which is acting, Deputy Director of Demand Reduction, which is acting. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with any of the individuals, but this is not exactly a heavy commitment out of the administration to get these people into a non-acting position and to firm up the funding and appointing of people. Furthermore, to give some other illustrations uh, that we have concerns with. The administration proposes to eliminate a million dollars for the National Alliance of Model Drug State Laws, which has been very critical in trying to develop laws across the country for states. Uh, administration has uh, proposed to uh, substantially reduce the CTAC program, the counter drug technology, in particularly the research part gets cut almost 50 percent, the technology transfer program gets cut uh, also by about, it uh, looks like, 20 percent. Meanwhile, it's increased as a small program the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency to 7.4 million and the world dues uh, to 2.9 million for anti-doping. Now, none of us, we've all talked about steroid use, we've all talked about the problem with athletes, but when you look at the overall problem and we say we're going to do performance measurements here and we look at the, the impact that we're having in the technology assessment areas, in the uh, areas of, of your own staff, of model state drug laws, and the huge abuse of marijuana in our society, of meth in our society, and then to take money from these programs and put huge increases in one shot into the steroid program, this more looks like it's a, a news release thing than an actual measurement of what's going to reduce drug use in the United States. And so first in these smaller programs inside your agency, I have deep concerns about what they're doing to your particular department. Uh, there may be some confusion here, but so let me try to untangle a couple of things in the presentation. I apologize if it's not as clear as it should be. Um, my agency is the uh, federal agency that is the pass-through to the, the uh, Olympic movement, uh, the World Anti-Doping uh, um, uh, Funding, and the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency Funding. Uh, it could be put in another agency. We are the, and those institutions have been stood up. They've been establishing what the various nations' contributions are going to have to be, and our request co corresponds to the uh, uh, the responsibility of the United States because it falls to the federal government to pay these dues. Those are simply a matter of we're members. The money comes through my office, and we are the pass-through agency. Um, on the other program areas, first. We have made a decision about the um, relative value and areas of investment. I recognize reasonable people can differ about how you apportion what percentage of money for uh, technology transfer in my office for uh, research. We believe both of them are important. And we're not, and again, I would say um, in this budget environment, as you know better than I know, um, we have more money in the drug budget. That did not happen by accident. 
That is a competition about resources and effectiveness. And uh, again, it is a competition that will be played out here in Congress, I know, as well. So um, we will, we believe, and the programs that we are sustaining, we're sustaining because we believe in them. As you see, there are programs we don't believe are working, and we have cut them. So uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have been, uh, and we have in some cases eliminated them. In terms of the personnel, let me just say, two of the place positions you raised are presidential appointed positions that require confirmation. The incumbents left those positions late at the end of the first term. We made the decision that it was not feasible, given timing, to nominate and confirm such an individual late in the term. We are in the process of, of, of working with the White House to identify appropriate candidates and to nominate them. Some of the other positions that are uh, more senior, um, we are moving to, uh, to fill those. Some of them are senior enough, frankly, that there's also been a custom where, um, you know, uh, depending on who's going to be the incumbent administration to allow them to select their own senior people. We remain funded. We are making some cuts in, that I believe are warranted by the efficiencies we've been able to establish with regard to my own personnel. Uh, we believe that responsibility for efficiency is not just elsewhere. We're a management agency helping the White House and the executive branch make wise decisions and give information to Congress about what works and what doesn't and where we can properly make investments. We try to make sure that we're a good example of that. But um, the, the effort to sustain programs that are working is something that I think we all believe in. And I also think that we all believe that just because something has a title on it and says it goes to do something that's worthwhile, if you spend money on that and it doesn't work, it doesn't serve the children or the adults or the people who need treatment or the people who need public safety. The goal is to try to fix these things and to provide uh, where we can more efficient use of dollars. Uh, we all wish there were more dollars, and you feel that as well as I do. Um, but there aren't, and um, uh, we have made uh, what we believe are uh, recommendations in this budget that will allow us to follow through with prevention and treatment and, uh, and law enforcement. Uh, essentially, what the budget does, as the chart here shows, is if you take the five functional areas of the budget, we have asked for roughly 26 percent of the budget to go to treatment, 12 and a half percent to go to prevention. 27 percent to go to domestic law enforcement, 23.2 percent to interdiction, and 11 percent to international. We spend more, we're going to spend more money on treatment than we do on interdiction. We're going to spend more money on prevention than we are on in international programs under this budget. We think that is the kind of balance. Now, if we were in a world where some of the demands on us weren't what they were in Afghanistan or somewhere else, would we move some of those dollars around? Of course we would. But uh, we think that part of the integration involves doing things that have to be done internationally. And I'll point out one example which I believe you're all familiar with. Last year, in the last calendar year, through the help of the Colombians, who have now reduced, and we don't have 2004 numbers yet, but just for 2002 and 2003, 30 percent of the coca that produces cocaine, most of which comes to the United States. And in the last year, our interdictors and their people in staging areas seized 400 metric tons of cocaine that did not come to the cities and the communities of the United States. So uh, we, now we all want this to be more aggressive. We're all hopeful that the, that the acceleration in Colombia and our ability to control borders and interdict will help prevent the poison as we treat the people who suffer from the poison, as we prevent young people from going down that path. But um, uh, again, this is a supply and demand problem. We're trying to control both parts. And we are trying to apportion resources across programs that work, treatment, prevention, public safety here at our borders and, and, uh, and uh, um, international programs that will make a difference because, of course, much of the substances that we face come from outside our borders. Be before yielding, and I'm going to in a second, I want to make, I, I'm going to do a series of, of questions in the second round that are in-depth because this is, we're trying to understand the budget directly. Uh, as I understood you to say, you felt that uh, you were 10 percent overstaffed, uh, that um, uh, you said through efficiencies you're able to absorb this, which is a way of telling us you were 10 percent overstaffed, uh, that uh, several of your acting positions um, are, in fact, you had a reason for. Uh, several others uh, were less clear to me. Uh, but what my problem is with this in general is we're having the same problem over in the Department of Homeland Security. We have a director, a, a coordinator of narcotics that has been put in in a uh, detailed position. Uh, they wouldn't fund it. They zeroed out the category for director of narcotics. This is a pattern across the administration, not just a, a random thing. Uh, I, I, uh, the anti-doping you said was a, a pass-through correctly. Is that correct? So did you support that or not support 
that increase? Yeah, I, we, you know, we believe the United States should be a contributor to these, these uh, uh, programs that provide integrity and, in fact, become a model for our own professional uh, 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 athletic uh, uh, enterprises and, and as well, and they keep, obviously, the, the Olympic movement uh, 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 better protected from doping as a form of cheating and, through chemistry. And as I understood, you said you're putting hard measurement criteria on this, and we would like for our committee's record the hard measurement criteria that the model state drug laws have not, in fact, contributed to the reduction of drug use that you said in your testimony, because I presume if you propose zeroing it out that they must not have worked. Uh, if you proposed increasing the dues for the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, apparently uh, in the national, you have more evidence that their program works than I do. If you uh, have um, uh, evidence that CTAC didn't work and deserved a 20% uh, cut or that the research program deserved a 40% cut, we'd like that provided to the committee because if this is evidence-based, not budget-based, then there should be some evidence. Yeah, but uh, look. I I've always been candid with you. I'll be candid here. You know, I would if I wasn't under oath. I am under oath. We're trying to make decisions, as you know, about programs and their effectiveness. We're also, we have uh, a, a certain amount of resources we can spend. So some things can work, but not be a high priority. Some things can work to a certain degree, but they're not efficient enough to be covered. We're not, we're not, we're making judgments. We don't have a machine that's like a thermometer that says, you got 80, de 80 degrees, you get $80. Um, we are making judgments, and I recognize reasonable people could differ. On the, U, uh, on, on the, an, the world anti-doping, that's a dues. We have to pay that or we don't get to compete in the Olympics. So, um, and we've agreed to make commitments to try to participate. That money happens to go through my office. It could go through HHS. It could go through another agency. I, I don't, that's just a matter of where it was, was, was lodged before I got here. Uh, on the issue of CTAC and others, certainly reasonable people could differ about where you want to put dollar for dollar. We've made a judgment. And on my office and, and, and the number of people, I didn't have people sitting around, you know, making chains of styrofoam cups. But I have made, through uh, uh, efforts at creating uh, a workforce that is more effective, to build in efficiencies, to work on, on focusing people, uh, what we think are prudent adjustments in workforce. I have been in government long enough to be in situations, I'm not saying you're, put, you're putting me in that, but where people make those kinds of adjustments then are punished for coming forward and saying, I can be more efficient, I want to take less and people who fought for the appropriation, the Appropriations Committee punish you for doing that because they think you kind of undermine cases they made. I hope we're not, I mean, I hope we, we can be fair enough here to say, look, we want agencies to be more efficient. This isn't about how many bureaucrats it takes to do the job. It's about the kind of job we do for the country and if we can be more efficient. Nobody's gutting my office. Nobody's forcing me to take fewer people. I'm suggesting that we can consolidate and focus our, our energies in ways as we've seen since I've been in the office about three years uh, that will be, allow us to be more effective in the future with fewer people. I think that's what you want. The te just for the record, the technology transfer program it is a model program that we are actually trying to set up and copy in Homeland Security that gets night vision goggles, it gets radios, it gets key things for local law enforcement to try to help them compete with the increasing sophistication of drug dealers across the country. You have set up a model program, we get a model program, and then we propose gutting it, and what it looks to me more like is a, a move to dollars to federal programs and away from state and local efforts, and, and that is the difference in, in policy. Uh, Mr. Cummings? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to just uh, piggyback on some of the things that the Chairman has said. Um, when, when, say, for example, the, uh, the President and his Cabinet, and you, I guess, proposed to eliminate the Safe and Drug-Free Schools grants to states and, and to um, cut the HIDA budget by $100 million. Uh, I just want to know, were you for that? Were yes, you sir. for that? And did, um, and how does that process work? Let me tell you why I'm asking. I'm not trying to, um, I just want to know because this affects a lot of people. And I think that when you've got employees who, I mean, I've sat and talked to some of these wonderful brave folk that work in Haida. And a lot of them are putting their lives on the line every day. And one of the things that they like to feel is that the people who are at the top are supporting them. I mean, that's just good for morale. Mm -hmm. 
And I guess what I'm trying to figure out for my sake and for theirs is how does that process work? I think, and then I'd like for your specific comments about Haida and about the Safe and Drug Free Schools program. I'm just using those two. Yeah, well, if you want, the, the general background is in terms of the, the construction of the budget, we send out guidance in springtime, essentially, to the, all the drug control agencies um, following the, the enactments of the previous year, um, the, or the current fiscal year, the, uh, or in the proposals, the policy that we're, we're contemplating, what we think works and doesn't work. We give them general guidance about their programs, directions, and futures. We receive uh, program level uh, submissions in uh, summer as they are submitted through the agencies to, uh, bef actually sometimes before they're submitted to the agencies through OMB. We continue discussions with the departments uh, about priorities and uh, directions. Uh, we receive sometimes information on evaluations and data during the year. We work then with the departments, with OMB, and then for those where there's a dispute, uh, um, there is an appeal process right up to the president on, uh, on critical budget matters. In the case of the two programs you raised specifically, uh, safe and drug free schools. I am aware, I've traveled around the country, that there are a number of people doing um, uh, important work in schools uh, that is partly or significantly funded by this program. I'm also aware, and we have said for some time, and we've had discussions with members of Congress, that the problem with this program is there also is an enormous, um, significant amount of money here that you can't show whether it's producing any results. And um, the program has been broadened. And in fact, you are allowed to transfer money, as some school districts have done, out of drug programs into other education programs. Now, again, we can have uh, a variety of flexi flexible programs. I'm responsible for saying what works in drug control. This program, after uh, uh, several years of working with the program staff, does not have demonstrable results. And um, there is uh, some indication that um, without that we have difficulty building those into this, this format. That's not helping a lot of the kids that need the help. It's holding the place of a, of, of a program that should, but it's not being restructured. We're proposing to put more money into national programs at education that can be targeted. We're proposing to expand and, and sustain uh, things like drug treatment, uh, um, things like community coalitions, things like uh, um, drug testing that we believe will help to expand and, and affect reductions in both prevention and in, in those who have begun to use by cutting off that use early or by treating it. Um, in the case of Haida, which I recognize is, is uh, um, a subject of, of some concern, we knew that when we made the decision, the program has important needs to focus on disrupting the market of the drug trade. There have been criticisms of the program that too much of the money goes to federal agencies. We have put more money in the FBI and in DEA to backfill some of the positions that were taken because of uh, uh, needs with regard to terror and to uh, uh, construct an intelligence network that will allow us to target both federal and the state and local task forces better, the fusion center that's being stood up now through congressional appropriation in, in Justice Department, a total of almost $90 million in those three categories. The $100 million uh, for the HIDA program that we are offering to transfer to uh, uh, or proposing to transfer to justice would allow us to do two things. One, put the program in the context of other justice programs and management under the Deputy Attorney General, where task forces exist. We know these drugs, the drugs that come to your city, are not made in your city. They come from other places. They come from other cities on the East Coast. They come from other countries. They come from organizations that market at various levels. And in order to effectively cut those off, we need better focus and intelligence and coordination. And where we're doing that, we make a difference. We have been trying to put this into the, uh, uh, the structure of law enforcement from federal to state and local task forces. The effort will be to maintain the state and local focus of the HIDA program, but put it under a consolidated management and direction that can work more effectively with state and locals to cut off the drugs and the organizations that are marketing the poison at the higher levels that make a difference. The 400 metric tons of cocaine I talked about seizing has happened without an increase in significantly in interdiction assets because of other pressures in the Caribbean and in the Eastern Pacific. The reason is we've had better intelligence. We, when we do it smarter, when we, as we do with terror, when we can identify individuals and when we can coordinate pressure on key elements, we can make a difference. If the federal government, on the other hand, however important local law enforcement is, and it is important, obviously, but when all those resources are, are drawn in a way to the 
largest number of potential sellers or the largest number, we're not cutting off the head of the snake. We, we, start, we start this process, which you and I have talked about, of taking generation after generation of young men, especially poor, minority young men in our cities, and putting them in jail. And I think citizens rightly say, can't we stop this? Aren't there people up the chain that, if we focused on, wouldn't allow this business to continue? That's what we're all trying to do. And the way to do that, we believe, is by, by using the intelligence tools which you have given us and which we have, we have worked with law enforcement to get, by focusing, and I recognize for some people, this, is a, this change is going to be painful. But the reason we're doing it is not to cut the budget. The reason we're doing it is to cut the drugs. And we believe that the record here will show that we've been able to strengthen OCDEF, strengthen the task force structure, and put this program in the context of other coordinated law enforcement programs to do the drugs we're trying to do to Al Qaeda around the world. Find the key elements, incapacitate them, keep them off balance, and to help, and to help reduce the terror and ravages they put in our cities. We have had, um, I appreciate your, your response. We have had a number of people in from DEA, DEA and others to come in and talk about how the fight on terror against terror has yield, yielded uh, some significant results with regard to drugs. In other words, we tighten up on the borders. We are, like you mm -hmm. said, using our intelligence uh, more extensively. And in that net, sometimes you come up with some, some, some drug uh, um, findings or results. And I guess I'm, I, as you, when you were talking about the 400 tons, I was saying to myself, well, you know, maybe it's, it's, it, it's true that a portion of that 400 tons came, you know, we were successful there because of our efforts with regard to terror. But let me give you the other side of it that concerns me. Um, the chairman and I worked very hard on trying to get, we were worried that when we moved to, to dealing with terrorism that the new Department of Homeland Security would not have, would not put the emphasis on drugs that we were hoping that they would. We were worried about that. So we had, uh, uh, we, we were able to create a position what was the name of that position? The counter narcotics officer. Yeah, counter narcotics officer. And I'll tell you, the chairman, uh, we had our counter narcotics officer in here one day for a hearing. And it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen because he was temporary. He had to beg for his budget from different people. Um, it seemed almost like he had been become a stepchild in the whole process. And I'll never forget that day because I remember the chairman and I looked at each other and said, is this what we created? I mean, we, we were looking for something, as somebody who had some real authority, somebody who uh, did not have to go around, you know, asking different people could they get money. And the chairman can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a kind of disturbing moment because it seemed to go against the very thing that we were trying to do. And I guess what I, I guess as I, you know, I listen to you, I just want to make sure that, see, with the Haida, they were, they were, they were definitely, uh, they had their eye on drugs. That was their, their, their thing. I just wonder when you move things around a little bit and you say, well, we're going to now have them coming under justice and justice is going to do this and do that. I don't want to want our efforts to combat the drug problem to get lost in the process. That's, that's what concerns me. And, you know, and I think that it's not just the, that I'm concerned about these employees that go out every day and put their lives on the line. I, I am very concerned about that. But I'm also concerned about what you're concerned about. I am concerned about the mission. Because as I've said to you many times, you know, I've got terrorists in my own neighborhood. Yes. And that people are much more afraid of, believe it or not, than they are of somebody coming from, you know, sending a bomb over to, to, to this country harming somebody. Because they deal with it every day. They see it every day. They see, they see their relatives destroyed by it every day. They see their property values going down every day. And so they see that they can't come out of their houses every day. 
So it's not like, you know, it's not like some foreign person over in Iraq. They, they're worried about what's going on in their neighborhoods. And so, and I think, I think, and, and he can speak for himself, I think the, the chairman had the same kind of concerns that we just, we don't, we want to make sure we deal with terrorism. We got to do it, no doubt about it. But we also have to balance it and make sure that we deal with the problems that we have here right at home. Yeah. And, and, and we could not have a, a stronger point of agreement on that. I also think of it as for those people who die serving in the armed forces in Iraq or Afghanistan or other places where it's less visible, um, they don't give their lives to allow our young people to be eaten up by drugs. They don't give their lives right. to have our neighborhoods destroyed. It's a failure to keep faith with them and the sacrifices they and their family make to not uh, uh, make this problem as small as fast as we can. Um, we agree, and the issue here is not about caring. Now, do I think that we can make some continued management improvements? Of course I do. I think the intelligence fusion that we're talking about is critical. I know people like to say, well, there's too much talk about intelligence and various centers, and are they really working? The key to doing this is intelligence. And I believe the battle on terror is not a, not a um, obstacle, but a lesson. This is a small number of people, small quantities of poison sent to our cities to, to kill our, our citizens. We need to be, we can't, we can't turn ourselves into a police state. We need to be able to go after the structures that provide that, and we need to obviously prevent citizens from being addicted and from starting this path who draw that through their dollars into our communities. We believe in that balance. Now, um, uh, again, people may differ about what level, what program, what contribution. We have made decisions that we, are, uh, uh, we believe are right. I recognize that people can have other opinions about the, the apportionment, but the key I think that we can't reasonably disagree with is we want law enforcement pressure against the critical elements that will break down the system. The higher, the better. The frequency of operations against high uh, level uh, structures in trafficking have to be uh, accelerated. We have to break down, as we do, the ability of these networks to, co to continue to operate when we take one or two people out. I'm working with the Justice Department. Two-year investigations, however great and dedicated people are, to take down somebody and charge them with 600 years of violations is something we're trying to change. We have created the first consolidated target list of, of, of uh, potential um, of, known, of known major traffickers, and we want to accelerate taking them down identify and remove them as rapidly as possible to begin to cause breakdowns. We have not had serious breakdowns except with two examples. It looks like the largest decline you see on teenage drug use is in two categories, LSD and ecstasy over the last three years, where in addition to the overall 17 percent reduction, you see reductions of over 60 percent. It is apparently because we significantly disrupted the supply in addition to getting out prevention messages on ecstasy. And on LSD, we certainly disrupted supply because we took down a major distributor who had, in an abandoned missile silos, made or had material to make 25 million doses. The consequence, we did not realize how centralized that was. The goal is to expand that so that we accelerate both prevention and demand reduction and supply reduction. Again, can we do that? Many people think it can't be done, that this is a business that is, that is infinitely capable of resisting damage by law enforcement. Um, and, and, and or by interdiction or by operations. We don't believe that. We believe people are making a difference every day. We believe 400 metric tons of cocaine that doesn't come to the United States saves lives. We all want to begin, though, to say people are having trouble getting drugs to harm themselves. They're getting into treatment. They're getting away from the temptation. And that's, I think, our common goal. Just one more question, if you will, Mr. Chairman, just mm -hmm. one more. I can't ask you because asking would be too cheap. I'm begging you to help us deal with this issue of witness intimidation. I'm telling you, we cannot have thugs going around killing people because they want to testify and cooperate with the police. We can't have that. I agree. Anywhere. I agree. And I, I cannot tell you how much this bothers me. Because what that means is, is that you, we will have a lawless society. Now, I don't know how bad it is in other places, but when you have a situation in Baltimore, 
where 30 to 35 percent of your cases can't go to trial because witnesses are being threatened and killed sometimes and harmed and they disappear. We had a murder case, uh, uh, not a murder case, some, a fellow comes and shoots up a school, shoots uh, into a crowd of students. They couldn't even go forward with one of the cases because nobody would testify because of what we think to be witness intimidation. And, and you know the Dawson case. All I'm saying, I mean, I just, we need help. I, I, I will talk to the Attorney General. Um, it's recently been confirmed. I've uh, uh, had brief discussions with him, but we're going to sit down and go review the full range of programs. I'll talk to him, and uh, we will get back to you on Thank what, you. what more we can do. Thank you. I'm going to go through some of the different uh, sections that were in your written testimony as well as in the uh, budget because I want to make sure uh, we'll be following up with written questions because as we work with the Appropriations Committee, as we work with your reauthorization and others uh, and have oversight over all these different programs, and our staff has been getting budget briefings department by department. Um, and uh, I want to say at the beginning, uh, uh, again, when I first was elected, and Lee Brown was the director of this office. I watched a man who had been uh, aggressive in local law enforcement in Houston and then in New York get um, uh, denuded in the office of National Drug Czar. And uh, he had to come up here and tell us all the time about how this fit the budget expenditures, how this was going to be more effective, how they were going to work uh, in, in other types of programs as he, we watched drug abuse rise year after year after they started doing the cuts and that we finally get it turned around, uh, with, uh, starting with General McCaffrey, who flattened it. You came in, have been very aggressive, a strong advocate, and all of a sudden, it's like, where did this reversal come from? Your requests are 200 million less than the previous year. Yes, you've had some reshifting. Uh, I understand that there needs to be targeting. I understand that there are, are budget pressures, but let me go through uh, uh, a couple of uh, other things. First off, Probably the most successful thing, and you fought for every dime, is the media campaign. And you've done measurement, you've retooled it. Um, we get these little fights on the side, but basically, it has worked. Now, last year you requested 145 million. This year, requesting 120 million. What you're requesting is what we appropriated, yes, because sir. as you and I have talked, Congress failed. It wasn't the administration that failed in the media campaign. Congress failed. We didn't. We have, in effect in real dollars had substantial reductions in this program from two angles. We haven't increased it inflationary for you. How long is the 120 million figure in there? Uh, the, well, the 120 million is for this year, but yeah, when I was, took office it was a $170 million program. And so we're down to 120 million from the 170. And last I checked, even though inflation rate's low, it's still been an inflation rate yes, every year. And the inflation in. rate in, in advertising purchases is higher than the base rate of inflation. So you have inflation and then amount. the cost of, of advertising yes, dollars. So uh, is it safe to say that the value of your 170 million would probably be 200 million today? Yeah. But I, well, I can't off the top of my head. No, I don't want to be cavalier. Um, no. I don't know, but it would be more than 170 million, sure. I would argue that you probably, uh, I mean, even inflation of 3 percent a year is a 12 percent increase, which puts you, puts you up near 200 million alone, yet alone the uh, yeah. rate of increase near uh, greater than 3 percent. Now we had lots of small programs in that. Uh, budget, you've tightened those up, you've worked with the advertising production cost, yes, you can achieve certain efficiencies, but I don't think anybody here is going to argue that you can achieve 40 percent efficiencies, that you, you have, have done uh, very well with this. Now, well, well, let me just Let me just say, just so the, we, we're, we're clear to you about what's happened. We have maintained in the target youth audience, middle-aged teenagers, the contact, uh, the, the, the reach and frequency of 90 percent of the target audience sees on an average four ads a week. We have maintained that throughout the program. We have strengthened the force. And, and for the parent part of the audience, I think it's about 85 percent see three ads a week. Uh, I'll have to go back and give you the precise numbers. But we have maintained that contact. Now, largely what we've done with that is there's a match, as you know, in this program. For every dollar we buy, we get two. We had, we had in the past provided part of that matching money to other youth-related programs. So Boys and Girls Clubs, other kinds of programs, SAD, MAD, would be able to match. We've taken the match back. The match is now running our ads almost exclusively. So we've maintained contact by focusing the program on our messages. And I think that's why you see it beginning to work. Now, I'm not against the, being I, efficient here, but again, again, I have a problem 
if I request, if I'm telling my, my, my colleagues in the administration, I'm going to request an amount, I can't get through Congress. You help, uh, others helped uh, with the appropriation process, but you know, to ask for money we can't show we can get through Congress is uh, to take money away from another program we should fund. So I'll be happy to, you know, I, I, to, I, I, am, I, I, I am worried because every year you know this program's been cut. I'm worried about keeping $120 million. Two, two things, uh, or a couple of things with this, and I want to make sure this gets on the record because this is the single biggest program left if Haida goes out from under you. This is the core of your office, and it's the core of our prevention efforts, especially if we ditch drug-free schools, that this is the prevention program, this and drug testing, which is a much smaller program. So this is our whole prevention program in the United States uh, under the administration's basic, other than uh, uh, a much smaller drug testing program. With community coalitions. And community coalitions, uh, which also is flat funded. Uh, that, um, and no new programs, in other words, it's a maintenance. Uh, that um, in, the, in the media campaign, uh, several things. One is, is what it means is, is that when we say we need to regionally target meth because you're trying to meet, reach the national, there, you have to go to partnership and then the match ads, we don't have the flexibility in the budget to do things other than this basic targeting, what you just described. In other words, reaching the target youth audience on the marijuana message, and we've had a great impact on that. But the diversity of messages and the things we were doing is what's partly been tossed out in the budget. A second uh, point I would make is, is that, as you know, well, uh, if you don't keep a, if you don't keep the 120 million uh, in the the campaign, at some point here the whole campaign goes down. In other words, if you don't reach a threshold in advertising, uh, all of us agree that the measurement isn't going to be there, and if we don't spend 90 to 100 million dollars to get decreased messages. I know you will dig in, but but uh, I would have several points here in this budget. When you request 120, uh, and OMB full well knows this that the odds of holding 120 become harder than if you request 145. This is a labor negotiation process. Uh, and if they don't believe that, I better not see a budget next year that has things that the administration wants at a figure that we didn't appropriate it. Because under this logic, you have a number of things such as move Haida to OSADEF. I don't think that's going to happen. If it, but if it doesn't happen, then don't come back for money for OSADEF if the principle is which you're telling me they tell you, if you don't get it funded, then don't request it. Then if they've got a bunch of funding things in here this year that don't get funded, don't come back to us, if that's the principle. Well, okay, let me try to correct a couple of points, because uh, I don't want to leave with a misunderstanding. Nobody tells me I can make an argument for anything I want, and I will do that when I think there's merit. But um, again, um, through a lot of work, a lot of support, including uh, 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 amazing support from some key members, including the Speaker, we got the $120 million. Mm -hmm. We've had a debate with the Senate over the value of some of these programs. You know that as mm -hmm. well as I do, because you both follow this. And uh, we are trying to work with Congress. This is a partnership. We understand that. And we're trying to make uh, requests that are uh, reasonable and that will cause, in some cases, change. You know, the other argument here is that, you know, we just kind of continue to go along and we don't provide leadership. I believe this is a leadership budget. We have drug use going down. We have drug funding going up. I know we're making changes. I know some people may not agree with some of those changes. But, again, we did not make these by accident. They are not a fait accompli. We believe they're right. It's not about this is a budget I'm holding my nose about. And if somebody says that, they don't know what they're talking about in the budget process. We made changes to take programs out that were less effective and support things that are more effective. Now, would I like, would I like more money in some of these programs? Yes, but you make a reasonable judgment about your ability to get um, the request because as both parties agreed, as recently as the last election, we got to get the deficit down and we need to keep the economy growing. We're going to have to control domestic spending. In that environment, when you know what the budget has, how many other agencies are taking substantial cuts, the drug budget, I repeat, is up and drug use is down. You're that's what you're asking us to do, and that's what we're trying to do here with these programs. On the Model State Drug Laws program, for example, you mentioned my office, I don't believe that is currently making the contribution it should make at a million dollars, and I believe my staff can work with states as we are working with cities around the country, including Baltimore, including Washington, D.C., including Detroit, and Los Angeles, and New York, directly to help do that. I'm asking to make an economy there. Congress has had a different view over the last several years. It wants a million dollars. It wants that as a separate agency. It wants to do that. Again, I have not changed my mind, and I'm not lying to you. I think we should zero that and let my staff do it. Congress, which, this is, year, being, again, which is being cut 10%. 
Your staff okay. is being reduced, administration is being reduced 10%. You have people that aren't being cleared, and you're, in effect, telling us that you're going to take over responsibilities for other agencies. Right. Uh, that, and furthermore, your request is down $200 million. What you're saying is Congress last year, uh, you're, you're increasing Congress's request, appropriated last year, not the administration's request. You reduce the administration's request. And then what I didn't go through with you is we believe there's some funny numbers in how you combine the, the drug I uh, dollars. In other words, there are things that aren't counted uh, in the drug budget and things that are counted in the drug budget and things that are uh, we don't feel are necessarily going to be used for narcotics that easily can slide over to Homeland Security and like uh, uh, Ranking Member Cum Cummings just said, we're a little less confident when things move to OSADEF that in fact, uh, or to FBI, that those are going to remain drug assets. I, I, I want to get into a couple of other categories. Well, can I correct just one thing I've been reminded for the record? My budget does not propose the reduction of one single FTE in my office. The reduction in salaries and expenses is because of reduction in rent and lease space, okay. which is an economy that's reflected there. So let me correct for the record, I am not reducing my staff. However, I will also stand behind my statement. This is not about how many bureaucrats are in my office. I resigned at the beginning of the Clinton administration when I was the caretaker to hand over the keys when they announced the cutting of the office by 80 percent, down to 25 people, because I stopped being the caretaker because there wasn't anything to hand over. I understand what the gutting of the office was, and I took a very strong stand at that time. Um, that is not what's happening to my office. I would not stay if that was happening to my office. And I want to be clear that uh, um, suggestions to the contrary, I vigorously object to. You had a 10 percent you had a $2 million reduction in rent, which is 10 percent of your total administration budget? I'll give you the office uh, budget. We can go okay, through the we, details. We want to see that because that would mean that your reduction in rent was 10 percent of your whole administration operations cost. Well, there may be other, other expenses. I'm just saying I'm not okay. proposing to cut FDE. Um, that, uh, and we also, uh, that leads to the problem we ran into in Homeland Security. We want to see then, uh, and, and we can follow up what FTE means, how many people are detailed. Um, uh, does this mean because uh, what we learned over there is when, when we got into it that they didn't have any dollars uh, that so they could say that they didn't get a reduction in FTEs because they were detailed and they got a reduction in detailees which reduced other administrative expenses. Now let me move to the Hyde question. Uh, Mr. Cummings has already raised this. Um, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions and then you can restate a little bit, but I want to, I want to, let me start with the end. In your, um, at your nomination hearing, you said you stated your opposition to moving the HIDA program. And you, when you, I, I'm now going to ask some questions to see how this relates. Do you believe that this move will increase, enhance the capacity of the HIDA program and of ONDCP to coordinate investigations and resources between federal, state, and local law enforcement? We created your office as a coordinating because we had all these other agencies fighting over who was going to do narcotics and that the whole purpose of having a director of ONDCP, and we moved Haida in because what happened is, is that if you didn't have direct control and the ability to move certain dollars around, uh, that, that um, uh, you didn't have power. All you could do is go into a meeting and say, I think, I think, I think, rather than having the ability to actually move dollars. Uh, so do you really believe this will enhance the capacity to coordinate? Do you believe that state and local agencies will welcome this move? That's certainly not what, what we're hearing. The whole design of this program was to draw resources from them and blend it with a small amount of federal money. Now, it, it, there's, there's, no, uh, there's a concern about this. Will it make them more likely to cooperate? That's not what we're, we're hearing. In fact, they have some disturbance. Do you think they prefer to work with OSADEF rather than HIDA as it's currently set up? Uh, do you believe that uh, the HIDA program will be more effective, uh, this transfer will be more effective than the HIDA program in the use of taxpayer dollars where we're leveraging a small amount? And there, in, in most of the HIDAs we visited as we were doing your reauthorization all over the country, most of the dollars in there were paid for by state and local people with the, the operational supplement to these huge dollars being invested. So, uh, and if you believe this is going to be more efficient, uh, what document, study, report, GAO evaluation, internal audit, or anything suggests that OSADEF is going to be more efficient at doing this than what we have already? Okay, and, you, and you and I know that I have some concerns about 
whether the HIDA program has been coming into a, a pork type program, how it should be targeted, whether there should be national targeting. I backed you up in a certain percent national targeting, but this looks like a wholesale instead of a 10 percent national targeting. And in your responses so far, you say we need to go after the top guys. But do we need to go after the top guys with 100 percent of the money? Or do we need to go after them as we try to work with and get cooperation? If you help us with some, we'll help you with some. This looks like a surrender of that strategy and saying the federal government's going to take all the dollars and we're going to go on our own. Good luck. Well, we're not, that's not what we're proposing here. And, and by the way, by cutting burn grants, those who don't have HIDAs, like my area, have a drug task force, now just had the burn grants slashed simultaneously. So to argue that the Justice Department with OSADEF is going to have an equivalent with burn grant in their department and in effect replace your office with the Justice Department, this isn't going to happen if burn grants are zeroed out. Well, let me, let me back up one second. I don't think the criteria fairly is do the people who are doing what they're doing now when you propose change, are they going to like that? Um, change of the kind we're talking about of significant restructuring is something that people, even when it's for their own good, if it is, sometimes resist. Now, there could be change that's not good. I understand that. Well, my just, arg my I argument... Wanna, I want you to clarify that what you're saying is that prosecutors, sheriffs, agents in the field uh, do not want change. No, no. The people who are, the people who are doing 90 percent of the arrests shouldn't be consulted when there's change? Shouldn't be, we shouldn't ask them whether they like the change? I don't understand when you say they won't like the change. Well, they might not, well, but they're the people on the, who are doing it. We're not arresting anybody. I was doing the intro to the, my response okay. to your question. Excuse me. I, 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 I don't think this change is designed to um, reduce cooperation. I recognize there are people who are, are not in support of this. We recognize that when we made the decision. The issue is, how do we best reduce the supply of drugs in the United States at the national and at the local and regional level? Everything that we know about this is that we need to do this by a better understanding of how markets work, identifying vulnerabilities, and by going after those vulnerabilities. Because of the multi-jurisdictional character of this, again, they don't make the drugs they use in your district primarily in your district, unless they're meth. They don't make the heroin, they don't make the cocaine, they don't make much of the marijuana, uh, they, it comes from somewhere else. That's why we have a federal enforcement effort. That's why we have these laws in this area of crime that we don't have in other areas, and why we work globally as well as locally. The question is, how do we better focus that? We're saying all of our experience with OCDEF, with law enforcement, means that our local task forces, which are, I will point out, in DEA, parts of OCDEF involve local people, as well as the HIDA program. Again, we are, yes, we are pursuing this program as a targeted, managed, directed cooperation. The $100 million that we're proposing for the program would be focused, as we've said in the budget, on state and local support, not on federal support. I talked about the increases we've made to other federal, key federal agencies that are participating to provide resources for them. Now, I know there are people who understand this as to be, the HIDA program to be a revenue sharing program. We have fought that battle. There are people in the Senate, there are people in the House, more in the Senate, who want this to be, you designate a place and they get a certain amount, and there are 28 places that get that, the rest of the country doesn't, or maybe it will, but we don't know. Um, we believe the best way, and the recommendation here is because we believe we have a chance to substantially reduce the supply of drugs by in, in strengthening our enforcement, and it must include state and locals in this case, but on a coordinated, managed, targeted basis. And so we are trying to integrate these, these uh, uh, enforcement efforts together under uh, the authority of the Deputy Attorney General of the Justice Department. We're trying to remain consistent in this case with state and local law enforcement. I know there are some painful decisions about what, how much federal assistance there's going to be to state and local law enforcement, and whether it's going to come through justice grants or homeland security grants or, or what the levels are going to be. And those are difficult. And then when the funding jumps around, people get jobs, their jobs are in jeopardy. That's a problem. And I'm not, I'm not ignorant of that. And I have sympathy for that. But when you have the positions that we have, you try to make decisions on the basis of what will best serve the interests of the country. And I recognize sometimes people are going to be unhappy. Sometimes they're unhappy for good reasons, and we need to follow what they're telling us. Obviously, they know things that we don't know, and we ought to be willing to learn. But we also have to make a judgment. 
And my judgment and the administration's judgment here is this program is a powerful tool. It has been a powerful tool. It can be a more powerful tool if it's moved and integrated, remaining state and local focused, and part of a consolidated effort that will increasingly, with the information we have and the way we're doing targeting, allow us to break the businesses that are the drug trade. Otherwise, you are chasing primarily small people, putting them in jail year after year, generation after generation. Break the business, don't break the generation after generation is what we're going for. Before yielding to Mr. Cummings, and, and I say this, and, and for those who, who uh, aren't used necessarily this uh, aggressive question coming out of me to administration figure, that we in fact share most of most views. We have some disagreements right now. You're having to defend a budget that, that basically I don't believe is defensible. Uh, that, um, and, um, uh, uh, but uh, this, is, this is, we share deeply almost all the different values. And that in, in my being aggressive and your being defensive, I encourage you to be a little more cautious because you in fact have implied several times that the primary resistance to this are people's jobs that people don't want to have change in certain areas because they're vested in a certain way. This is somewhat a disagreement of philosophy, not about who has turf or jobs. Uh, that okay. um, uh, I believe, as you aggressively do, that Colombia, Afghanistan, I've made those same kind of arguments, but it's a balanced approach. And I believe this budget is gutting a balanced approach, and that's my concern. Mr. Cummings, did you have some? Let's go on. Can you explain what data goes into OMB's program assessment rating tool and how Haida and the media campaign were rated? Do you, do you know? Yeah, the, the principal data that goes into it is the reports that are part of the uh, GIPRA uh, process and the, the government uh, results and uh, um, a government uh, uh, accountability statute that each program is supposed to uh, provide. Uh, the quality of the design of those uh, uh, plans and uh, um, objectives for the program, and then the quality of the measurement of achievement of those. In other words, if a program is supposed to have a pur pur certain purpose, but the operation of the program is not aligned with that purpose, or is not able to um, uh, uh, carry out that purpose, or the data shows that if it is aligned properly, it's not achieving that purpose, it gets a lower score than one that is. Uh, th again, this is a tool. It's a tool for the decision maker. It's not the decision maker. From a very practical standpoint, what happens to the height? Let's say the budget goes through as it is right now, as proposed. What happens to the height of offices? Well, we're proposing, again, we've proposed this as a, as a starting point. We have not proposed this as a, deci as a decision in all detail. I will work with the Justice Department. We will work with people in the field to, uh, to uh, realign the program under the principle of uh, integration and um, uh, coordination uh, focused on state and local support. I presume that means that um, you know, some of the structure uh, uh, may continue as is. Some of the structure obviously would change, um, but we have not had, we have not made a, uh, we, we, we've not decided that in advance. We, we obviously need with a program this involved, with the partnerships involved, we're going to need to work with uh, uh, not only Justice Department, but obviously people in the field. But it, it could mean, and it's reasonable to assume, and you may have said this in what you just said, that some of those officers actually, the locks will be put on and the, the program itself is gone, will be gone uh, out of some of these 25 at least. Yeah, sure, everything's on the table at this point. Um, you know, I guess, I'm, I mean, I was listening to some of the chairman's questions and, um, you know, it's was, it was, it was my understanding that back in FY 2006, um, budget scores, a $300 million increase for the U U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement as drug control spending. But when, when my staff looked at the, the, uh, the ICE webpage, they saw items describing ICE's efforts in the war on terrorism, investigations into Canadian telemarketing fraud and child sex abuse cases, and the extradition of a double murderer to Honduras, but not a, not a single item explicitly, explicitly relating to drug control. How is it that ICE is scored as a drug control 
while the cost of prosecuting and incarcerating defendants for drug crimes is excluded from the restructured federal drug budget. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, I appreciate you you're asking me that question because I think we've kind of touched on this topic and I'm glad to have the chance to respond. Um, as you know, in the first strategy that we uh, released in 2002, we announced our intention to restructure the budget. Right. Um, the goal of this restructuring was to focus the program uh, array on the things we're doing and managing to make the drug problem smaller, not just the cost of the drug problem. There had been in the past, beginning when I actually served in the Reagan administration, when this problem became, is to try to also capture how much does the, gov does the government spend on the drug problem. But many of those that were arrayed, partly they were arrayed to show that the costs were, partly they were arrayed to show if you spend a lot of money, you care a lot, which sometimes is true, sometimes is not true. So, for example, programs like Head Start, because a small number of the people who came in relatively might have gotten referred to treatment or prevention. There was a good faith effort to estimate that, and that small percentage arrayed against a large program created a large number. So you had a large budget. But the problem was, I believe that was fundamentally dishonest and certainly wasn't good management because we were scoring parts of things that we couldn't manage and we couldn't work with you at managing. So we reduce the budget to the managed programs that are designed to make the problem smaller. So we could, for the first time, take money across supply, demand, prevention, treatment, interdiction, and uh, international programs. Now, there are pressures on those programs that have to be kept in mind, but we could look at these things and really do them in a comparative way. For some agencies, a small number, um, for example, some DHS programs, um, uh, Veterans Affairs, the, and this is modeled on what happened at the Department of Defense, you have multifunction programs that do not pull out a single component like DEA or like the block grant for treatment. What did we do in that case? We issued a series of circulars asking those departments, once they got their appropriation and on the basis of the appropriation we represented, to give us a financial expenditure plan where they would manage those dollars for drug control purposes. For example, we made a change in this year's budget with regard to Veterans Affairs. Veterans Affairs had scored not only the treatment, and as you know, they're the largest single hospital system in the country, and they spend a lot on treatment. In addition to that, they were scoring related health care costs for people who come into treatment. Sometimes those health care costs are a result of your addiction. We know there are diseases. But what that happened to do is capture roughly a half a billion dollars as treatment funds connected to this budget. As we refined these numbers in the process, we took those out. I could inflate the treatment number and the demand reduction number today by half a billion dollars just by not, by not making that change. What I chose to do is to focus on what are we really spending here and to talk about what we, what, not what the drug problem costs, because you know the costs. A large portion of mental health costs are connected to substance abuse. A large portion of, de of dependency and welfare costs, child endangerment costs, uh, as well as a variety of other costs, prison costs, prosecutorial costs. Those are not managed costs. Those are consequences of the drug problem. And we're not going to not give somebody uh, um, health care and Medicare and Medicaid that's, that may be because the disease is related to drugs because we didn't fund the drug portion of it. We're not going to not incarcerate people that are convicted because we didn't score this. Again, we provide information on costs. We provide a report, which we just released again, on the costs of drugs to the society the specific institutional costs, incarceration, uh, problems in our jobs, health care costs, missed opportunity costs. Uh, we provide that report in a separate publication that covers all those costs. So we're not hiding any of those costs. What we are doing is providing a budget that really shows you what we're spending. And so when you make choices as legislators, you can say, I think this, this, ratio, this ratio is wrong, or I think this program makes sense and this doesn't make sense, and you're not getting a, a scored uh, a array of money that doesn't mean anything. It also allows people to say, you know, we're spending $80 billion on drugs, and, and well, how can we show it's effective? I recognize $12.5 billion is a lot of money. I haven't been in Washington so long, I don't spend that. But I like to point out to people that um, for those that think that it's a lot, it's a big country a country that spends $25 billion on candy a year. So I think this is a responsible budget that focuses on the responsible, responsi the responsible programs that work, and we need to make sure that that's what we're focused on and not about accumulating costs for reasons that really confuse the central debates we need to have. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Cummings asked you about ICE and the fact that ICE doesn't have anything on their home page or, and we're having a tremendous problem as a member of the Homeland Security Committee figuring out what they're actually doing in drugs. Why is that in the, the budget when, it doesn't even, when, they, when they don't even acknowledge in their homepage that they do it? 
Well, again, I can't account for what's on their, their web page. I can't account for what's in their financial plan, and we'll be happy to provide that to the, to the committee. I think that's a truer statement and, uh, of, of what's going on here. And obviously, I could put anything on a web page and make it seem bigger than it is. Uh, the issue is, what are you doing? But I will say that ICE is a valuable and important player in a number, not only of investigations, but obviously enforcement actions. And we are working with them, as we are with other agencies of Homeland Security, and the personnel there are, are, are making important contributions. You know, I'm sorry that some of this stuff doesn't get conveyed to the public, which is important, and to, and to other people as clearly as it should be. But um, I don't think that's that's indicative of the fact that they aren't doing, and we can't account for the fidelity between what we propose in the budget and what we see as results to the best of our ability in these multifunction agencies. There's an alternative explanation to what you just said. In other words, your explanation is is the home page may not be reflective of what they're doing. And what we're, in effect, questioning is, is the financial proposal to you reflective of what they're doing? Because maybe the home page is reflective of what they're doing. And that's my concern from hearings cross-examining ICE officials. Well, I believe those financial plans, and my staff can correct me if I'm wrong, are also subject to their financial authorities' audit and, and uh, uh, vouching for it. So um, you don't get just to kind of say you spent that much and we say, okay, great, we take you at your word. There are internal financial and fiscal measures. Again, when we imposed using these authorities that are actually are in the office and are a subject of, I think, our reauthorization, when we imposed these, they were not particularly welcome in a lot of these agencies because we were now telling people in agencies that, you know, in addition to kind of like giving us an estimate of what you spend that you then can go ahead and do whatever you want with, you're actually going to have to do what you said. And we're going to require, we require a spending plan before they spend their fiscal year money. So we'll be happy to, you know, let you know what we see and what the what the corresponding report is on the on the fidelity of those financial plans. But again, we have done this to create a real representation of where resources are going and to really make be able to make decisions about priorities that are consistent with what happens as to the best of our ability. You know, one of the um, uh, the um, programs that we have been able to move uh, enthusiastically um, under this subcommittee was the Drug-Free Communities Program. It's a program that we embrace because it was a way, it is a way, of empowering the everyday citizen who wants to address prevention and drug problems in their neighborhoods to do something. There's so many people who are probably watching us right now who are sitting there just feeling helpless. And so that was a, that's a program that, that, that I like. And, I, and I'm sure that and it's just based upon conversations with my colleagues, not only on this subcommittee and committee, but in the Congress. Um, get a lot of inquiries about it. People want to try to help their communities help themselves. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the effectiveness of using taxpayer dollars. And I just was wondering, you know, what's your, what was your, what's your assessment of the drug-free communities program? And, um, you know, and then, then we had, had the Coalition Institute, and now I see that uh, their budget has been cut by half, and I'm just wondering where, what, I mean, where, where are we on that? Well, let me make clear. We have level funded the Drug-Free Communities Program. We've requested uh, the same funds in the various components that we requested last year. In this budget environment, we did that because we think it's an important program. It's a measure, as you can see, we have made sometimes painful decisions on programs we don't support, and we, we re made those recommendations. We have doubled the number of drug-free communities during the first term of the Bush administration. Now 714, uh, we've worked with your office on, on, on one of those coalitions in, 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 uh, in your district. Um, we believe this works. It is in the process, though, because as a new program, of a complete evaluation. It has been reviewed under the part structure you made, but we are in the process of creating an evaluation mechanism that will allow us to tell whether those communities are effective, and I have instructed my staff to accelerate that process to the maximum extent possible because I think what we want to do is to see um, uh, as clearly as we can what the contribution is of those communities in uh, reducing drug use. We believe it allows us to bring together, as you know, faith communities, 
treatment, law enforcement, private sector, government, schools, parents, public officials in those communities, because we know that when they all play in a, a critical role in this problem, we make more uh, progress. Um, and we think that is the, that's the way to go. The program is designed to, as you know, help to form coalitions, help to stand them up, give them a number of years when they, if they're working to be able to be supported and to then get them supported by the community. So we're hoping to be able to um, uh, uh, continue the process of growing that program. But um, um, the goal is, uh, uh, I think, uh, certainly reflected in the, in the, the goal of uh, increasing those communities we have, the number of communities we have met, we continue to, to, to push the program. The reason why I raise the question is it was 10 million under authorization, but I guess your argument would be that if it's level funded, considering all the things that are happening to other parts of the budget, that's considered a victory. Is that, is that, and I'm not trying to be yeah, facetious. I, yeah, I, look, I, 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 look, if, uh, Would, would you make some of these decisions in another environment? Maybe, maybe. But um, again, I think this program is strong. Also, I think it would be useful to us to have the evaluation. Um, again, I, I think people feel very good about the program. I think it's done some remarkable things. I visit a lot of these communities. It gives hope. I agree with you. My staff, I'm instructing to actively try to recruit more in areas that we identify where there's a drug problem. This is a tool that's relatively uh, inexpensive that allows us to help organize people in our cities, in Native American uh, uh, areas that have been hit by substance abuse, in rural areas where people feel isolated. We have all kinds of examples of, 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 of these that work. We have created mentoring coalitions to help start other coalitions. We have a lot of things going on. We have people who, and yet we're also being rigorous and saying where coalitions fail, we, are, we want to be able to replace failing coalitions with new coalitions that have an opportunity to work and allow failing coalitions to have an incentive to to, to make themselves work. We went through this, I think, with the, some of the folks in your district where they had trouble getting themselves organized, but now they're there and now they're moving, I think. And, uh, I'm they sorry. are. And, and, but that's what I was trying to get to when I talk about the coalition piece being cut in half. It seems to me that if we really want to maximize our dollars and try to guarantee as much uh, progress as we can, you want to build up your coalition. It seems like, seem like your institute, if you build that institute up, have that cooperation using um, uh, best practices and things of that nature, then you have a better opportunity of maximizing effectiveness. That, and I guess that, that was one of my, I mean, I know it's a small amount of money, but I'm talking about the, the, yeah. the coalition piece. But, but I think for that small amount of money, the dividends, are, are just huge or have the potential of being huge. So the last thing I think I'd want to see done is, a, you know, cut the coalition institute piece in half. You follow me? Yeah. Again, I, I understand this as we are not only supporting the community coalitions program, we are supporting the institute. We are not supporting it at the same level Congress appropriated last year. You added a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that under those circumstances, our request last year is the right request this year. People will have other views. We're not trying to cut the effectiveness of the program. We're trying to make sure we support the program and continue that effort. And in this environment, again, um, I think this is a measure of uh, our seriousness and support, not a measure of criticism here. And we may be a difference about how much money to put into the Institute versus, I mean, look, my own view is I want to keep that million dollars in the base of the program to start more uh, uh, coalitions. It's $100,000 a year. A million dollars is 10 more coalitions. Maybe somebody thinks that a million dollars in the Institute is a better way. Um, I guess my view is I want to keep that million dollars in the, uh, in the coalition program. Now, you could say, well, why don't I just ask for, you know, uh, another million dollars? Because I also have to worry about the technology transfer program and CTAC and the, and the uh, media campaign. So we're trying to make in an environment that's responsible decisions about proportionality, which I recognize reasonable people could differ over. But um, uh, that's... That's the thought process, I'm being honest with you. Let me just, just ask you this. You said, um, I think you said, what, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that when, I guess it was Clinton first came in, you decided you wanted to leave. Is that what you said? No, oh, um, that was too brief. I'm sorry. Um, at the end of the President's father's administration when I was working at the drug office, uh, there was a request for um, individuals, uh, political appointees. I was actually a deputy for supply reduction at that time 
to stay on in each of the agencies to transfer the agencies to the incoming administration. I was asked to be that person at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. There were 146 FTE in the office at that time. Um, following the inauguration, so I was in there, uh, it was February 9th, I believe. Um, I was there till that point. Um, I was working with the one person that was there for transition. And the administration announced that it was going to cut the office from the 140 plus positions, and we had already removed political appointees, uh, so it was below that a bit, um, to 25. I did not believe that there could be a serious transition to 25 people. Mm -hmm. And so I resigned at that point before uh, 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 Mr. Brown was nominated and confirmed, which I would not have done, but I just felt that, and that's why I maybe was too defensive when the chairman suggested that my office was being gutted. I've been there, uh, and I have strong feelings about the office. I don't think the country is certainly stronger than any single bureaucratic office, but I think it plays an important part. And so maybe I was reacted a little more strongly than I should have, but um, um, I watched a lot of destruction and I, I lot watched a lot of what we had built up because the office just came into existence in 1989. And I think, you know, while the office doesn't simply make for the national effort, I do think it's, it exists to coordinate things that need to be coordinated and when it's broken, things start falling apart. And um, uh, as long as I'm here, I'm only going to be here as long as I think things aren't falling apart, and I don't think that's what's happening here, and I maybe reacted a little too strongly to the hint that the chairman thought they were, but um, uh, um, uh, I, again, I, I recognize that uh, um, um, we're all in the same agreement on this, but uh, um, there was some painful history there. Mr. Let me just ask you this. I, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm, I, I'm curious. When you look at the cuts, is there anything, any of these cuts, that bother you personally? I mean, I, 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 I believe in you. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, and, and uh, but I'm just wondering, is there anything here that bothers you? That you look at and you say, well, you know, maybe we've gone a little bit too far here, or maybe this is not gonna get it. I mean, is there anything here? Um, or did you leave, lose, lose a little sleep over? Um, I think that the, um, the, 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 the array of, of programs that we're talking about here are, and not just because you know, I'm in the administration, are the things we need to do. Uh, the places that we've increased funding, I believe, are, are critical places. Would I, if I had a free hand, do more? Last year we asked for $200 million in the President's Access to Recovery Program. Congress gave us $100 million. I believe and the President believes we need more money in treatment. We believe we need to provide it in a flexible way. We, need to, we believe we need to provide it to more of the people who are seeking treatment and don't get it. We came back and asked for uh, uh, $150 million. Um, I recognize in this budget it's going to be hard to get the additional $50 million. Uh, I certainly know that both of you uh, care very much about this and we're going to need help again to try to get that. I'd like to see more of that. Uh, the other large cut that you've brought up, I mean, look, I. I believe the HIDA program will work better or the purpose of HIDA by restructuring and focus. I sense there's a disagreement among us about what we should be taking our bearing from and so forth. I believe that we can change the face and we can only change the face of supply reduction systemically by coordinated intelligence-based federal, state and local enforcement. We are partly moving there. We need to accelerate that as rapidly as possible. Now, maybe we should have some discussions with you and maybe some of your key staff about what tools we think we're bringing to bear and why we think that so that you can have a full understanding of maybe why it's not just a matter of somebody says yes and somebody says no from the executive branch. You have many things you have to be concerned about. I understand that we should be fair in making sure we're making you fully aware of what we're thinking so you can judge whether or not we're right. The other area is obviously the Safe and Drug-Free Schools program. I understand that this is a certainly a serious cut and I certainly understand that it affects the, the apparent balance in the program. The, and I certainly appreciate the many people who are working in schools uh, to be effective. The problem with the program is that um, the, in this environment, the program's not focused effectively and demonstrably on reducing drug use and prevention. Um, we believe that we can uh, better support that by working in community coalitions, 
by nationally targeted programs. We put more money into the national program part of the education account to allow accountable grant programs to reduce substance abuse. We also believe that, frankly, as we've talked, um, uh, the other areas of support that we're trying to foster are building into the health care system a better ability to screen for drug problems early with doctors and pediatricians and hospitals in the screening and brief interventions programs, in the effort to bring drug courts. We're trying to double the drug court program. You know, the drug, there have been 400 more drug courts last year alone, up to over 1,600. Everybody knows these works, and they're, and they're critical for people who start down the path to stop and to get them early. Um, we also believe that drug testing is uh, the most powerful and uh, potentially far-reaching and lasting program. If we can get over the misunderstanding that it's going to be used to punish, that it cannot be used to punish, it allows us to connect the understanding of addiction as a disease with the tool of public health that has changed the face of so many childhood diseases. You know, we can't give people the treatments we have for HIV AIDS if we don't test them to find out whether they have HIV. We don't, can't treat people for tuberculosis if we don't test them as to whether they have tuberculosis. And, and when we do, certainly we have to worry sometimes about, about the stigma. But in this case, we know testing works for adults in major uh, parts of our, not only the military and transportation safety, but when I go to schools, I see kids who are afraid. I'm sure they're the same kids that you see in Baltimore, the same kids I see in other cities and places. Middle school and high school, they see what's happening to some of their peers and some of their families. They do not understand why adults don't do more to stop it. And it's a, because, in part, in addition to prevention, it's a game of hide and seek. Kids start, they bring this behavior back, they encourage their friends to use with them. They're an example. Drug use is fun and it doesn't cause any consequences. Look at me. That's an ad for drug use. What testing does is it gives those kids the ability to say, I can't use, I get tested. It's an amazingly powerful prevention tool, and the schools that have it, kids feel safe. I got to tell you, if I extracted a part of the argument you just made, it would fit very nicely with justifying keeping the safe and drug-free schools piece. I'm just telling you, what you just said, what you just said. You know, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about it, and then I'll finish. I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, when I think about safe and drug-free schools, I think about the fact that when, with our kids, um, it's not always the deed, it's the memory. Mm -hmm. In other words, a memory that we impart with them that lasts them for, for a long time. And I couldn't say, as I was sitting here listening to you, I couldn't help but think about my daughter who's now 23 years old. I'll never forget she came home uh, when she was about six years old and she says, guess what I learned today, Dad? I said, what's that? She said, I learned the fire department came in and told us to stop, drop, and roll. And I'd never heard it, of that, believe it or not. But we were, and the reason why I came to my mind is because we were talking about it. I was kidding about it the other day. But what I'm saying is, you know, I'm just wondering, when I heard your testimony about the drug-free schools, you know, it seems like the, the problems that you talked about, in other words, trying to measure, making sure the money actually goes into, um, you know, efforts to stop our kids, prevent our kids from from uh, using drugs, it seems like there would have been a better way than, say, eliminating the the the, the, prob the program, even if you reduce the fun even if you had to reduce the funds. I don't agree with that, but if you had to, but to zero in a bit, you know, on specific, because uh, on those specific concerns, I'm sure you may have had more that you did not mention. But what I'm saying to you is, sometimes I think we need to the same reasons you just gave are the same reasons that I think it's important that we send those messages as early as possible and hopefully when that young person gets in that environment in the 10th, 12th grade, 11th grade or whatever and they're around that, you know, drugs, they can harken back to a time when there was some program in their school where Ms. Brown said something about not using drugs. It may sound very simple, but it's very real. I think one of the things that Americans are asking for, you know, I hear all this stuff about moral uh, concerns and, and the elections and all that, but you know what people really want? They want to make sure that government help them raise their kids in a safe environment, in an environment that is healthy, mm -hmm. and so they can grow up and be productive citizens. And I think that we, those kinds of programs like 
uh, the drug-free school, safe and drug-free schools is one of those things because all kids go to school and we have a captured audience. So just something that I just wish you'd consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I want to ask some additional questions on international. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, first, uh, you don't only manage different uh, programs, but you also weigh in on a wide range as our number one uh, anti-drug spokesman. And I wondered if you've weighed in with USAID concerning its financing of harm reduction programs. And let me give you two examples. At the 14th International Conference of Reduction of Drug-Related uh, Harm was held in Chiang Mai, Thailand on April 6 uh, to 10, 2003. It was sponsored by the International Harm Reduction Association, the Asian Harm Reduction Network, and co-sponsored by the Center for Harm Reduction and USAID. What was a federal agency doing co-sponsoring, in effect, a drug maintenance, uh, as you and I have worked with this uh, 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 issue, harm reduction is a code word, um, uh, what were we doing and did you speak up to USAID and say this is not what you should be doing with federal dollars? Also, the Asian Harm Reduction Network's 350-page second edition manual for reducing drug-related harm in, Asian, in Asia contains a USAID logo and the production of the manual is acknowledged inside the cover. Quote, this pr publication was made possible through support provided by the Office of Strategic Planning, Operations and Technical Support, Bureau for Asia and the Near East, United States Agency for International Development, end quote. Included in the second chapter of the manual, Rationale for Harm Reduction, are sections on, quote, needle and syringe programs, quote, sales and purchasing of injecting equipment, and removing barriers. Chapter 5, Injecting Safely, are sections devoted to, quote, sharing of injecting equipment and safe injecting. Did you review the USAID drug program, and have you spoken with Administrator Nastios about the abuse of taxpayer dollars, clearly contrary to the intent of Congress? Yeah, I'm, I wasn't aware of these publications, or I, I, I didn't attend that meeting. Um, I will say that, uh, um, as I think you know, um, we have been pretty aggressive with international bodies that have been uh, called to or drifted toward harm reduction, uh, more aggressive than I believe uh, others have been in the past, as this has become a more pervasive issue. We've reminded people of their treaty obligations. We have uh, uh, talked to uh, media in some foreign countries, including Canada, and you were with me. Uh, we have met with international bodies, including UN bodies, about this structure. Um, I was not aware of the particular publication. I'll be happy to look into it and report back to you. Thank you. Um, let me move to, uh, you and I uh, argued yesterday about drug-free schools, so we won't go through that today. Um, that, uh, uh, but I have some concerns. I know the program isn't as effective as it should be, but I, I don't believe it should be zeroed out. I believe we need to make it more effective. Let me move to, uh, let me go to intelligence next, because you talked about intelligence and you made a statement with which I don't agree. I, I agree that intelligence is the most important, but intelligence without the assets to uh, effectively do something about it is a problem. And we have been hearing steadily from uh, the different agencies about concern that our intelligence is identifying uh, targets and we're not able to implement. And this budget, I believe, will make it more difficult to implement. Now let me give you an example. JADF South is a, is a successor, as you know, to old JADF East, which is based in Key West. They're responsible for coordinating drug interdiction uh, between Defense, Customs, Coast Guard, and other agencies in Gulf Coast. JADF West, based in Alameda, California, was responsible for the same mission in the Eastern Pacific. And as of October 1, 2003, JADF South's area's responsibility was in expanded to include both the Gulf Coast Caribbean and the Eastern Pacific, which was before under California. Now that the JADF West is in Hawaii, they are, have a far more uh, Western uh, outlook. This change has greatly increased JADF South's workload, which goes directly to your question of intelligence, mm -hmm. but it has apparently come with no additional resources or personnel, so they now have Caribbean and Eastern Pacific. Uh, and, and at the same time, the Defense Department has reduced their budget. So while we're talking about the importance of intelligence, we've consolidated and factually reduced, and it did not transfer those resources. In other words, they reduced JADF West when it went, and they did not transfer them to the South. So given uh, this DOD reorganization, what have you t done to make sure that we have adequate resources that they can manage it in JADF South? Um, yeah, the, the 
the use of those interdiction resources, as you know, are um, something that we at times have to triage because of the platforms and the need for those platforms in a variety of missions. When we raise the threat level, we pull Coast Guard and other military assets into roles that uh, uh, may pull them out of uh, interdiction service and have in the past, as well as uh, 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 when we uh, uh, have other kinds of demands in the, both the Caribbean and the Pacific that are specific and may move some of these around. Um, we have a limited number of these platforms and personnel, um, so in some cases, yes, it's a dollar issue, but in some cases it's a matter of you know, you have, to, you have to use the pieces that are on the board at the present time. Um, there have been, and there are people, as you know, as well as I, who have worked uh, uh, heroically uh, over time in this area as in other areas of Homeland Security and Defense to uh, do the additional job that, that they've had to face in, since September 11th of 2001. And I think their, res their results speak for themselves. It's historic levels of seizures which no one has ever seen before. In fact, uh, levels that for the first time give us the possibility of having a uh, fundamental change in the ability to market some of these substances on the basis of a con significant uh, contribution from interdiction. Um, we are trying to work to make sure that these uh, resources are allied. But I, as you know as well as I, I can't tell you that we don't wait, face you know, demands on military personnel, military budgets, as well as Homeland Security Agency. So we are trying to triage this. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, anyone can say that the, the budget as it was presented is uh, chintzy with regard to Homeland Security or the War on Terror. We've tried to focus on that, understanding it's the first priority. And um, yes, we're still going to, we still have limits. And so um, I understand your point, and I've, I, I, I'll continue to try to work to uh, help to make sure the resources are there. My staff works regularly with the people in those, those centers and those agencies. But um, um, uh, I would expect that, you know, at, at times and sometimes uh, for, for some duration, um, people are going to feel some additional weight, and sometimes uh, we don't have all the platforms we want. We're trying with this budget to increase the available flight hours, for example, for maritime patrol aircraft, which are a critical part of the interdiction process. We're looking at deploying, and the Coast Guard has been heroic in deploying more of the Hitron teams that are so effective in, uh, in uh, this kind of interdiction in, in most of the, both the East Pac and the uh, Caribbean. So um, uh, again, though, I would say, the achievement here under these circumstances is largely because of um, substantially improved intelligence that helps to give us the ability to use platforms in a targeted way. As you know, you've seen this. There are vast amounts of ocean and vast amounts of air and vast amounts of land that you got to cover. And if you're out there patrolling around looking for something, you aren't going to find much. Does it make you sick to the stomach when you hear people at these intelligence agencies saying we can see this stuff moving, we don't have the resources to stop it? Knowing sure. that people it, are going to die on the streets of the United States because we don't have the resources to stop it now that we know it's coming. Sure, but the the goal here is, um, and again, you know, I also am aware that this is a, you know, this is a, it's an operational setting. Uh, um, you try to have as many resources as you can in an optimal way because there are demands on resources other places um, that are also designed to save lives. So, um, you know, uh, we can't just make sure everybody's got everything they want in one sector all the time, and that means we're going to try to optimize uh, productivity and make a judgment no, about how. Part of what the frustration, and it's bubbling up in, in Congress, is, is that we had a battle in the last administration of where initially the Defense Department had put uh, drug use. They had put it at the bottom. By the end of the Clinton administration, to their credit, they had moved it back up. Our current Defense Secretary moved it back to the bottom. So we've seen a weaken at JTF-6 and in consolidating into to North Command. We're having a battle over uh, airtime assets in the Caribbean and South America. We're having this similar battle in, over in Afghanistan that I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, that, um, and the fact is, is that we have intelligence. Uh, they've pulled refueling support out, which has been very critical, and we could, we could uh, uh, get that in a speculative question of potential terrorist activity. Uh, when we know we have 20 to 30,000 people dying annually of drug abuse, when we see a load of cocaine and heroin coming and don't catch it, uh, because we have, are trying to prevent something that we don't have, I mean, it's a risk assessment game here. 
and that we all, none of us want a nuclear, chemical, or biological attack to hit the United States. None of us even want a small, dirty bomb to hit the United States. The question here is you have to do risk assessment. And, to some time, and, and this is what some of us are pushing. Sometimes you're going to need to be the skunk at the picnic because somebody's got to say, you can't put it all over here for an infinitesimal risk and ignore what's coming at you that's terrorism in the streets of Baltimore, terrorism in the streets of Fort Wayne, and let it come when we see it coming, where we know it's going to land, but we've got a boat pulled over here because there's a one one thousandth of a hundredth percent chance that something may be coming over here and everybody panicked. And, and that's literally what's kind of happening right now in the resource battle, because nobody wants to get blamed for missing something. Uh, that that uh, we've diverted resources, and that's why we're questioning the ICE budget, because it doesn't uh, reflect that these resources that might be dedicated to drugs, the second they have any kind of warning, they go off of drugs. Whereas if it's a drug agent who's assigned to that, like we're battling in the Air and Marine Division, if it's somebody trained to be a drug agent, we know that the likelihood of them being diverted for anything but a real threat is minimal. But if it's a budget item that says this is for narcotics, and it isn't a dedicated narcotics person, it means that about 80 percent of the time they get diverted, that the, the boat, unless it's a clear drug boat, gets pulled back into harbor. So we get it counted in the drug budget, gives us, oh, we're, we're flat funding drugs, but in fact, we're not. And the same thing with air platforms. And what we need to know out of your position is that you're going to be a strong advocate internally and stand up and say, look, we understand there are other problems, but I'm the drug guy. And you can't forget us, or we're just going to get run over by the huge complex that's pushing the terrorism and the defense side, which are important, which every member of Congress campaigns on, including me, but not at the expense of forgetting what's happening at the grassroots level as people are dying in the streets back home. Let me get into Afghanistan, and I'll finish with, with my round of questioning here. That um, I have become concerned that uh, not only did we allow the biggest growth in heroin in modern times there on our watch, partly because this was a low priority and the uh, Defense Department does not grant the link between, or has not at least historically granted, the link between terrorism and drugs. They did not understand how many people were dying around the world, apparently, in their, their effort because of very, it's a very difficult terrain. It's a very difficult country that nobody's ever been able to get control, including the Afghanis themselves under any administration in their history. Uh, we know that there are uh, warlords in the north who get tied up with it, but most of it's down in the Pashtun area that's critical to the support of the government. It's not like I haven't been there, I haven't talked to it, I haven't met with cars. I know how difficult the process is. But the fact is that um, on our watch, it soared, that we had knowledge of where this is. We haven't sprayed it. The British didn't spray it, and then we didn't spray it. That Secretary Powell seemed very committed, but the current secretary seems to be backing up, and I have a very deep concern about that. And in the last two weeks, we've seen a whole bunch of publicity on the news that seems more to be, be praising the efforts rather than acknowledging that our efforts there are miserable. That, um, that uh, they put uh, several DEA agents in who are more or less trapped in Kabul. We've, we holler about getting them helicopters, and then they propose second-rate Russian helicopters or other helicopters rather than the helicopters that we would put our own military in, and then act like two DE agents are going to solve the heroin problem there without military support. They need uh, Huey helicopters. They need uh, uh, soldiers to protect them coming in. We would not dream in Colombia. We would not dream in Colombia of doing what we're doing in Afghanistan. And if, if the administration continues to defend not spraying low-grade helicopters, minimal in Afghanistan. I do not know how I can go to the floor in a straight face or go down to Columbia and tell them, by the way, you have to spray. By the way, we need helicopters that are high-level helicopters. By the way, we need to have troops to support you in the ground so you don't get shot out of the air when you go to your area. Because what's worked, as you said, in Colombia is having these type of things. And in Afghanistan, what in the world are we doing? And that our, uh, those people who've been involved in this are disturbed that other members of Congress are going over there and getting a whitewash. And the question is, is somebody in the administration going to stand up and say, look, you're doing better than you were a year ago. But the fact is, is as you have said in front of our committee and, and I've said, the Taliban had a huge jump in heroin. Then for two years, they basically went down because they stockpiled it. So has some news story right now or some spray story on the national news that says, oh, the opium farmers in South Afghanistan decided not to grow this year. They just had the biggest growth in world history in Afghanistan. So 
so what if they don't do it a year or two? We didn't send any message, and we're urging them to do alternative crops. What we know is alternative crops won't work unless they see they aren't going to make the money out of heroin. Then they'll talk to us about alternative crops. Is anybody taking this message to the rest of the administration before, uh, if Secretary Rice and Secretary Rumsfeld both developed this attitude, we're in deep trouble. At least Secretary Powell was battling with Secretary Rumsfeld about it. And Congress has been battling, and we need to know where you stand, and are you going to speak up on our problems in Afghanistan? Well, let me start by saying the budget that we were discussing includes one of the largest single one-year increases, I think, in any place outside the Andes for Afghanistan. We are putting resources there. We've done resources in regard to the supplemental. The circumstance, I think, we also need to be, um, as you and I have discussed this before, we may see this in slightly different ways. Um, several years ago, Afghanistan, for the first time, got its independence. Within um, last year, it not only elected its first president, but just before that, got its first constitution. As people reported at the time, some people who voted for president said for the first time in 5,000 years, somebody asked the people in Afghanistan who they wanted to have govern them. Uh, I think we've seen the benefits of democracy here. We all understand that the largest single threat, I think including President Karzai, but certainly the Secretary of State, the current Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, certainly uh, the President and my colleagues at the White House, that one of the single, if not the single biggest threat to the democracy in Afghanistan is opium production. Um, President Karzai has um, um, sought this time, this year, to respond to what everybody thinks is remarkable growth uh, from last year's production by organizing the leadership in a fledgling democracy, the governors and some of the other leaders, to, to knock this down themselves. He strongly made the argument that for this year he doesn't want to spray, and frankly, um, the, our ability to move and put in the infrastructure we have in Colombia in several months was probably not a, a, a very uh, uh, conducive situation to have a massive or significant spray. Uh, you know we're talking about over 200,000 hectares of poppy. We sprayed 130, 140,000 hectares of coca in, in um, Colombia in 12-month period last year uh, with a full and uprunning program. Poppy has to be eradicated in roughly three months, and we have doubled the area. The op tempo would have to be, if you look at that, six to eight times the rate of what you have in Colombia. You can't, even the United States, cannot drop that in in two months. Um, and as I think you also, because uh, you, you've been involved in this, you also know my experience in working with countries of the world is it makes an awful lot of difference whether the leader of that country wants to do this. The difference in Colombia today, while we have resources that are obviously critical, the single biggest difference is President Uribe. His goal is zero coca, zero poppy in Colombia, and he has aggressively pushed that. We have leaders in other countries that have been our partners who are working hard in difficult circumstances, but they are not as committed, they are not as able. Now, for President Karzai to ask for the, this year to say, let me do it the, my way as the new leader of Afghanistan. Let me try to rely on governors, some of which I've transitioned out uh, and put in my person. Uh, some of the uh, leaders and some of the military leaders that we have moved. Let me put an Afghan face on this. Let's not have in this new democracy spraying, given the history of some of these, these factors in the past with uh, Russia and uh, or the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. Let me try to do this my way. Now, I don't know whether some of these accounts that have been recently written about how much progress they make. I am always skeptical of these things until we prove them. We have teams, as you may know, now going out and looking to see if we can verify this in the short term. And we will report those, obviously, to you and, uh, as, and other members of Congress and the American people as soon as we have something definitive. I don't believe we'll have a survey until the end of the year, but we can see, hopefully, uh, uh, with enough people out there, what's going on. But Many of us do believe that ultimately, if you're going to eradicate on a large scale, you're going to need to do uh, spraying. I will point out, though, that um, uh, when, when, when President Arebe took office, most of the people who gave an assessment of him, including not only intelligence agencies, but some people in Congress and in the executive branch, said he cannot do what he says he's going to do. And in every single case, in my 
experience. Everything he said he's going to do, he's done, or he's done more than he said he was going to do. Um, I don't know what the relationship will show in the history between uh, President Karzai and what he says he's going to do and his achievements. But I do think in a new democracy and given the importance of, of, the, lo of the leadership of the, of the nation um, and under the circumstances we face with the logistical uh, situation of our own, giving him a chance to show what he could do in Afghanistan is a, is a reasonable position. Now, on the issue of how much do, do, do U.S. agencies support this, as you know, we are trying to and we are training police, military, supporting court systems, alternative development, uh, infrastructure development. Um, all those things are ongoing. They're in a difficult security environment in some places. Uh, there are other priorities that we've had to face over the course of the last several years that have made it made our ability to have to triage security situations and while supporting elections and other things uh, not the easiest task even for the United States of America. Um, I don't believe that we've made bad decisions. Now, on individual emphases here or there, but I don't believe that we have failed to kind of to, to do what we could do under the circumstances. But that doesn't mean that we're happy with where the poppy or the opium uh, trade is. We need to go after it more aggressively. We are proposing, and my office has been involved directly in creating a strategy that includes five parts that we are going to try to implement on eradication, institution building, alternative development, standing up a cooperation uh, domestically and internationally that we believe will make a difference. But um, again, until we get there, I'm not saying it's done. But I do believe the path for creating a better situation, uh, not only for democracy, but for the drug trade, is a path that we can reasonably uh, expect ourselves to follow. Are we impatient as you are? Of course we are. But um, um, I do think that um, um, while reasonable people might differ about emphasis or, or how we construct this, uh, given where we started, given the primitive circumstance that we're in, uh, given how fast this came back and, and under the overall threats we felt in the we, we had to face in the global war on terror, um, uh, Afghanistan is a remarkable success in terms of what institutions are today. We have to get rid of the poppy. And President Karzai and I think the people around him understand that. And that's that that as a as a lead partner in this relationship is critical. Uh, I I appreciate your explanation. Um, I believe if the American people knew the classified material, they would be outraged. Uh, and I believe as that comes out, uh, we are going to face a problem here in Congress uh, that is greater if the administration doesn't address directly and aggressively uh, what is, is impossible to sit on indefinitely. Uh, that um, the fact is, is that we knew where supplies were and we didn't attack them, uh, that there were political reasons not to do so. Uh, that um, we don't control much of the ground now, that President Karzai has given us lots of words, and I've heard them, and I believe he is an honest man in trying to do it. We do not take this out of President Toledo um, in, in Peru, and if he sees us, uh, he's in a teetering democracy that just had a terrible uh, a previous administration. He's in a teetering position. That democracy could fall. In Bolivia, it could fall. In Ecuador, they had seven presidents in nine years. And if they start looking at it and say, oh, teetering, we, got, we can't do this, we, we send messages that are going to reverberate around the world based on trying to treat Afghanistan as a different type of a country than other countries. I understand that historical, but hey, the heroin wasn't there when the king was there. It was not a democracy, but it was a quasi-democracy, and it was a nation for a long period of time. It was not unorganized, uh, and, and it had a, a period where it went chaotic, and I know it's difficult. It's difficult in any country. President Uribe did have the courage to come in, but what partly he saw was DMZs, like we have right now in Afghanistan, do not work. In fact, in Afghanistan, we have 80 percent of the country in a DMZ like we had in Colombia, where we can't eradicate, where we can't go in, and that that type of approach in Afghanistan, maybe it's too late this year. The British were in charge of it in the first place. We did a hearing on that. It may have been too late to get in this year. Then we ought to be going for the stockpiles because we're going to spend millions and millions of dollars trying to interdict around the world now as a follow-up because we didn't spend it at the front end. And that's what our I, concern is. I want to be clear. We don't believe it's too late to eradicate. In fact, we are training a centralized eradication force that will be in the field doing forced eradication in addition to the supplements that President Karzai is, is, is organizing or attempting to organize with some of the provincial leadership. Uh, 
I just I was talking about aerial eradication only at this this point in time. Again, I think that ultimately on the magnitude we're talking about, there will there will be a, a considerable need for aerial manual, eradication. Manual eradication can't even begin to hit a tiny portion, particularly when it's not safe to go on the ground and the only areas we can eradicate, and this is what we ran into in Colombia, is, is that if you only eradicate manually a small section of a country, and that's a country that in effect you control yeah, the ground on, what they do is they just plant in other areas where we don't control the ground. The military has to get involved in this because this is a shooting war and the DEA and the State Department are not going to be able to do spray planes. They're not going to be able to, how's the DEA going to do a bust in trafficking when people have all sorts of military weapons? That in Colombia, we don't ask three DEA agents to go in uh, with, with uh, some State Department employee flying a plane. We have to have whole kinds of trained units to protect them. The only organized force right now in Afghanistan is our military. And if they don't take responsibility, the world will be so flooded with heroin that we won't get this undone for eight years. And that's what many of us in Congress who have wor worked on this issue, Dana, uh, Congressman Dana Rohrbacher is upset, Congressman Mark Kirk is upset, and that, uh, furthermore, downplaying it on the military side, which is what they're doing right now, and trying to say, oh, it's not that great a problem, and they're going to be good for a year or two. This is what the Taliban did. It, and they didn't even produce at the level. You don't that the market to keep the price up, they've got enough right now, unless we hit this, the stockpiling and go aggressively at this, that, that it, it's a long-term setback here. And we don't have like a year for some of this. Well, let me just say, I don't believe anybody's downplaying this. I don't believe the President, I don't believe the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, I don't believe uh, uh, the other officials that I work with, I don't believe the British are downplaying it. I don't believe President Karzai is downplaying it. They understand it's central to the future and the stability and the possibilities of, of peace and stability and democracy in Afghanistan. The question is, um, what is a reasonable um, um, a plan for the way ahead? We don't intend to drop three DEA agents anywhere and tell them to go do X or Y. We are creating coordinated teams with Afghans and U.S. personnel, some DEA, some others. We are working with the British. We are working with other countries that have responsibility for some of the uh, areas or cities of Afghanistan to integrate the enforcement uh, against labs, against uh, 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 people that are involved in trafficking, against uh, uh, the growing and cultivation, and, um, uh, and the interdiction of uh, the movements of drugs and drug-related uh, uh, movements of uh, uh, precursors and others. Um, again, we are creating an integrated plan. We are standing it up in an environment which is more primitive even than Iraq. We are trying to create this with a country that wants to have leadership in its own country. I think the key here is, you know, there are limits to the resources and the people that we can employ to kind of take over Afghanistan. But also, more than that, you got to give the country back at some point. You know, that's what we, what we have in Colombia is certainly a lot of U.S. support. But the massive effort is Colombians, and Colombians that we've helped train, we help support, we are on some operations with them, we do provide equipment. But basically, uh, you know, the operation, and I think what's so impressive about the operation is how the Colombians are taking the, to the forefront. And I think that is a difference from some other places and sometimes in the past even in Colombia. President Karzai is asking to have his people in the forefront. We are supporting them, including the U.S. military. What the ops tempo is, and I recognize there are some people over there who, you know, criticize some of the other agencies when they're not there or they don't do what they want and so forth. This is part of our job to try to manage this in reasonable ways. I don't consider the goal of making nobody unhappy reasonable, but you're fair to say it is grown, it is unacceptable, it has to be contained and has to be shrunk for both reasons of drug control and reasons of, 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 uh, of controlling terror and providing stability in Afghanistan. But I disagree if there's a sense of, you know, uh, people don't get it. We get it. We're trying to do it. We are trying to do it as rapidly as possible. Could, do some people have a view that we should have done more faster in some areas? I understand that they do. I sit through these meetings. I know the demands on other uh, sectors and personnel here. I do not believe that, it, that what has been done was either unjustified or unreasonable or because somebody was heavy-handed. I know that people believe that defense has not been as aggressive as it could be and reasonable people may disagree about that. Since it's drugs are ranked 24th of their 24th priorities, I think it's a safe assumption. Well, 
except that if you look at what the Defense Department is doing, it's not 24th out of 24 priorities. It has maintained its funding. It has maintained its support in critical areas. It has uh, been aggressive in providing support for critical parts of this effort. The reason we're better, again, uh, I understand what you said earlier, which I didn't get a chance to comment on, about you know, if we see drugs coming to the United States uh, um, from South America and we don't stop it, of course it's troubling. But again, let's step back and look what the record is. We have historic seizures. Massively fewer drugs are getting to the United States. Not a few fewer, massively fewer drugs are getting to the United States than ever before through the support of Congress, plans, and Andean initiative that was started before I got here and started originally in its original form during President Bush's father's administration. Um, and massive increases in the effectiveness of, of, uh, of interdiction. I'm sorry that some of that's not maybe as prominent or balanced on the websites of some of the agencies. But do I care more what's on the websites or what's not getting to the streets of America? The fact is those men and women are saving lives every day with what they seize. Are we going to do better? We are all dedicated to try to do better. But again, I don't think it's fair to leave the impression that there's a massive amount that we're not getting or it's staying the same or we're declining in our effectiveness. We are massively more effective, not slightly more effective, massively more effective every year. And I believe the budget that we're proposing will capitalize on that progress. Well, thank you very much for being so patient today and taking so many questions. I, I believe that uh, we've been more successful. I am very concerned about the changes proposed inside the uh, Department of Homeland Security from the Shadow Wolves to the Air and Marine Division to how they're using the Coast Guard that will reduce that effectiveness. I'm concerned that they're lowering their emphasis and, and funds to drug intelligence. I'm concerned that given the fact that we've made our first progress largely to your aggressive approach that we seem to be uh, backing away from some of the other things. I do want to say that in the budget, I very much appreciate your continued advocacy of the treatment programs. I thought there were a number of programs in there on from drug courts to prison reentry type things that are very important that have been neglected in what we do inside the prisons. The President said he was going to focus on this and he is uh, beginning to address that and I hope you'll continue to work with us on that because that is a key part and I think you've got a, a balanced approach overall but we have some strong disagreements sure. and I'm sure you're going to hear about it from a lot more committees than just this one and uh, we'll continue to work together with that. Uh, thank you for being with us and we'll go to panel two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you'll if you'll stand, we in this committee we do uh, as an oversight committee. Uh, do you swear that the the testimony we give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I swear. Let the record show that the witness responded in the affirmative. Thank you for your patience as we uh, work through this budget, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, we go ahead and give your testimony. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to be here today to speak about the workability of the current ONDCP budget concept. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland and a researcher at the RAND Corporation, but the testimony represents my own opinions not those of either Rand or the university. And I hope my written testimony can be entered into the record. My testimony will not deal with the proposed 2006 bu drug budget, but with how well the current ONDCP budget concept serves Congress and the public as a representation of federal drug policy. The agency made major procedural changes in 2003. I argue that ONDCP's changes, if properly implemented, could generate a useful document for that agency. However, there still remains a need for ONDCP to prepare a more comprehensive document fully representing what the federal government spends to reduce the nation's drug problems and providing the basis for fully informed policy decisions. Moreover, there were problems in the implementation of the new procedures that resulted in the omission of some major policy items that even on the rationale offered ought to have been included in the budget. Let me start by saying the drug budget serves a number of purposes. For many users, it sort of provides just an important description of the federal component of U.S. drug policy. It also serves more functional goals as well. Very few of in individual programs have been evaluated, and so the drug budget was often interpreted as providing a broad sense of how well the federal government was doing in its drug control decisions. And in the 1990s, ONDCP constructed an elaborate performance measurement system 
linked to the detailed budget. Until 2002, the published budget aimed to be as comprehensive as possible about federal expenditures. The resulting figures had limitations as a tool for policy decisions by ONDCP. Consider federal prison expenditures, which I'll come back to, a major item in the old budget. Given the flow of convicted offenders from the courts, two factors determine these expenditures. Existing laws, namely the mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenders in federal court, and two, the guidelines established by the United States Sentencing Commission. If Congress wishes to spend less on incarcerating convicted drug offenders, it will have to reduce mandatory minimum sentences and or direct changes in the guidelines. Neither of these are options for ONDCP in its budget certification and policy role. Thus, Bureau of Prisons expenditures for incarcerating drug offenders did not represent a number that ONDCP could influence. Medicaid presents the same kind of budgeting problem. It's an entitlement program. There's little direct budget flexibility. The real power to address substance abuse issues in Medicaid, which can be quite substantial, is through other policy levers that might increase the eligibility of high-risk populations. In 2003, ONDCP developed a new budget concept. First, it would only include programs that reduce drug use and not those that only reduce the consequences of drug use. Second, it would not include expenditures that were sort of buried in much larger and broader programs, though the director mentioned a few exceptions. The two distinctions proposed are reasonable ones. Subprograms that reduce the adverse consequences of drugs, such as health care for AIDS patients or indeed prevention uh, aimed at AIDS, in fact, as a consequence of sharing needles, will have no effect on the level of drug use. This may be a worthy program, but will not have consequences for the targets that ONDCP uses to assess progress in the fight against drugs. And ONDCP is not alone in making this kind of distinction. The British government, a sophisticated practitioner of drug budgeting arts, makes a similar distinction among programs using the terms proactive and reactive. The other change had a more pragmatic basis, agencies with small drug-related workload or with programs addressing a wide range of issues uh, beyond drugs were removed from the budget unless funding could be reorganized and displayed to show drug funding in discrete decision units. Done properly, these two changes would allow ONDCP to focus its attention on programs that specifically target drug use and that are not buried inside larger programs, a reasonable enough exercise for the agency's own purposes. However, there are two problems. First, as implemented, the new budget does not seem to meet the criteria laid out for it. Important items that should be included are omitted. Second, and perhaps more important, there is a need for a more comprehensive budget for broader public purposes, not just for ONDCP's decision making. The major difference between the two budgets, as shown, uh, the two budgets under the two procedures, as shown by comparisons of the provided for fiscal 2003, is the exclusion of almost all costs associated with the incarceration of federal drug prisoners and the exclusion of most pro prosecutorial expenditures. These amount to about $4.5 billion, uh, according to estimates by John Carnevale, former ONGCP budget director. The only Bureau of Prison Expenditures included in the new budget are those that aim to lower drug abuse among prisoners. Thus, the Bureau appears by function only as a treatment agency. This seems distinctly odd. Incarceration and prosecution are intended to reduce drug use by affecting the supply side of the market. The vast majority of federal drug inmates are there for smuggling or selling rather than for using or possessing drugs. Incarceration is what makes investigation, which is included in the budget, effective as a method for deterring drug dealers. Investigation does impose its own costs on the drug distribution system through seizure of drugs and assets. However, the bulk of the penalties that federal enforcement imposes on drug distributors result from incarceration than from these other penalties. Thus, if one seeks to estimate the total cost of federal efforts to reduce drug use, then both prosecution and incarceration will be included, not just investigation, as is now the case. Moreover, the Bureau of Prisons is not an agency of which drug control is buried in a much broader mission. The majority of BOP inmates are drug offenders. Thus, even by the second of the tests offered by ONDCP, namely the explicitness of the drug control role, its expenses could be included. A similar question can be raised about the exclusion of most prosecutorial expenditures. Prosecution precedes incarceration is also a critical component of the drug enforcement system. The logic for including incarceration costs in federal supply applies equally to prosecution. I've only had the opportunity to mention a few examples of the problems created by the new procedures. More are provided in the written testimony. 
The reformulated ONDCP budget concept, if properly implemented, can serve a useful purpose. It focuses the agency on what it can influence. However, the budget document needs to be supplemented by the recreation of the old, more comprehensive budget, which can inform the broader debate about drug policy. This will allow the public and Congress to better understand the costs of current policy and help them make more informed decisions about issues that are important but lie outside of ONDCP's jurisdiction. It would be even more useful if the budget were to include regular estimates of expenditures by state and local governments. The only estimate ever made, done for 1991, showed that state and local governments spent as much as the federal government, if not slightly more. Probably true today. Estimating these figures is complex but feasible. If Congress wishes to have a full understanding of drug policy in the nation and the role that federal programs play, it needs this broader set of figures, at least on an occasional basis. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Cummings, do you want to start first? I just, um, you heard the, uh, the testimony of the director, did you not? Yes. And um, when I uh, asked him about, and I assume that you're, you're familiar with the uh, programs that uh, safe and drug-free schools I am. You heard his comments with regard to that, that uh, we are now basically eliminating that program. I mean, did you have any opinion on that? Uh, yes. Um, actually, about four years ago, uh, I co-authored a study um, commissioned by the Department of Education, published by RAND, uh, evaluating the uh, Safe and Drug-Free Schools Act, and I must say it was fairly negative about it. And, that and is what? to say that we felt that the evidence suggested that the money was very broadly used and not focused on uh, drug programs and many, in effect, many programs certainly of unknown effectiveness and implausibly effective were being funded. So you, were in, you would have been, I guess, generally in agreement with um, Mr. Walters with regard to because uh, it sounds like you're saying almost the same thing he said, that money was being spent on things that, it, that were not directly to address drugs use and drug prevention, and that it was very difficult to measure it, it, uh, its, its effectiveness, that is, uh, these, uh, these funds' effectiveness in, in that program. That's correct. I mean, th this was money that was treated almost like a formula grant. And the result was that it, you know, money was distributed in very small amounts to, to schools, and the cost of trying to evaluate, even keep track of what the schools were doing with these funds was simply unjustifiable. And uh, uh, the Clinton administration proposed a rather, as I remember, rather clumsy restructuring in which there would be lots of evaluation, but if you take evaluation seriously, that really chews up a lot of money it was a question about whether you couldn't come up with a different way of distributing the funds that focused the funds more on high-risk schools. You know all the uh, forces that tend to get money distributed more evenly into almost a formula grant that go against that. Uh, but you could certainly design a program which did two things. One, focused on higher-risk uh, schools, and secondly, uh, made better use of what is known about effective prevention programs. Now, it's interesting that you said what you just said, because one of the things that uh, Mr. Walter said during that uh, discussion on safe and drug-free schools was that, um, that he found that uh, one of the more effective uh, uses of funds was to be able to, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, search lockers and things of that nature, if I recall correctly. I mean, have you found that to be an effective? I, I am not the person to sort of get to the details of what are effective programs. I, uh -huh. you know, I am a reader of the literature and not much of a go out into. And um, let me say, it's, you know, l let me give you an example of the limits of what we know here. Okay. About f four or five years ago, a panel of the Department of Education was asked to assess what were known to be effective and promising prevention programs. And about 150 providers of programs offered their uh, 
curricula for judgment by that panel. At the end of the day, they identified nine as of proven effectiveness, and only, I think, two or three of those nine were broad-based drug prevention programs. Some were very focused, like those on steroid use amongst, amongst athletes. The simple truth is that we don't have much basis for giving schools directions about what are good programs to use. Well, that isn't to say there aren't good programs, but we, don't, we do not have uh, a, an empirical basis for making judgments of effectiveness. So does the restructured budget stand in the way of formulating sound drug policy, you think? Yes, I, I believe it does. Uh, I mean, not, I think, with the precise matter that we're talking about here, um, I mean, I think that could be fought in terms of the existing, uh, existing drug budget. But um, I think the, the omission of the prosecutions and incarceration, I mean, it's terribly specific, but that's a huge item. We're talking about four and a half billion dollars there. And sort of discussing the federal effort without including that is sort of discussing sort of the discussing the land area of the US but sort of skipping Alaska. I mean it just it, it gives you the wrong view about what the federal government is doing. As I said, for for many of OND, you know, for ONDC's purposes, I fully understand the in the Bureau of Prisons decision, prosecution is a little more difficult, but I understand the logic. But if you're then talking about Congress as a decision maker, surely it's important to know what it is that is being spent on the enforcement side in the full, aimed at reducing drug use, not merely the consequences. And the prison and prosecutions are a very important component of that. You know, so when you, okay, I'm sorry, please, no, please. Go, go ahead. You know, one of the things that, uh, when you mention prisons, one of the things that I always found fascinating is how people's drug problems could become worse when they went to prison. Prison has always been a school for um, uh, worsening of problems. It's not that nobody gets better in prisons, but rehabilitation is not what prisons tend to, to do. It's more like dehabilitation. Uh, I used to do work on organized crime, and I was talking to um, a, a low-level Brooklyn um, mafia associate, and he got talking about people in Chicago, and I said, how on earth? I mean, he'd hardly gotten to Manhattan. I mean, this is a guy very local. And he was talking about Chicago, and he said, well, we were in Atlanta together. And you just sort of realize that these are, in fact, ways of, of both forging networks and, and improving skills, I'm afraid, um, uh, that, that happen and have happened over many generations. Would you have liked to have seen uh, more money? Well, would you like to see more money going into prisons for drug, uh, to address drug problems? I mean. I think it's important to remember that the federal government is a, only a moderately important player in terms of prisons for drug offenders. I think the US prisons have about 60 or 70,000 persons in them for drug offenses. They're probably more like 250,000 in state prisons, and if you include local jails, I mean, that probably adds another 150. So if you ask, should the federal government be locking up more prison, more people for drug offenses, you really want to take it in the context of the total incarceration that we impose but on But that the, wasn't my question. I'm sorry. My question was, the prisoners that they do have. Yes. Um, should part of our policy be to make sure that federal prisoners get drug treatment? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's not a particularly high-risk population. I guess a lot of these people on that level, on the federal level, may not even be using drugs. That's, that's I mean, so state prisons have a much higher risk population. Mm -hmm. So I, I have no judgment about sort of exactly how many, and the federal prisons are sort of better served than state prisons are, but if you had treatment resources for prisons mm -hmm. at, available, it would be state prisons that are in most need of it rather than federal prisons. Let me ask you this. You heard my questions on immigration and the customs enforcement. Yes. Can you comment on that, please? Um, in, in the 
late 80s and early 90s, agencies were eager to show how much they were doing on, on, to deal with drugs uh, because it was the leading crisis at that time. The drug crisis, the, the drug problem is an important problem now, but clearly not seen as anything like the leading crisis. Agencies understandably uh, think that other missions have higher priority and I think it's very, very plausible that at the margins they divert resources that have the drug label on them to other things. But I, I certainly am in no position to, to judge that, they are do that that has occurred. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to, and I know you're not trying to, but if you were to give some advice to us within your sure. own parameters, as people who sit on here trying to use the taxpayers' dollars effectively and efficiently, and as persons who see methamphetamine use destroying people and crack cocaine, powder cocaine, heroin, so on and so on, destroying people and communities, and if you were to give an opinion or give advice as to things we need to concentrate on as legislators, what would, what would that advice be? Okay. I teach in a public policy school. We take advice seriously. That is to say, I don't particularly value my opinions about things. I'm much more comfortable saying what are the consequences of choices than saying which you should make. There are well, no... Well, why don't we do that? Why don't you I'm give sorry. me the consequences <laughs> of proceeding the way we're proceeding with the budget. You're, you're familiar with uh, yeah. the, the budget situation sure, sure. here? No, I, 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 the I'm proposed budget, and I want you to tell me what you think the consequences will be if we proceed down that road, the road we're going down, um, as opposed to some other road that might take us in a more positive direction. Okay. Uh, how about that? Okay. With that sure. Reinforce your question. For example, in the were you here for the last uh, oh, director? The Walters, whole thing. Yes. That um, director Walters clearly stated over and over, and you could hear us fencing that he sees nationalization of some of these programs as opposed to the dollars going to state and local agencies, giving them resources, giving the prosecutors the hides. For example, there is a very particular thing. What would be the consequences of right. of that substantive change? All right. Um, look, look, you've asked me a broad question. I'll take some liberties. First thing is to realize that policy it works very much at the margins of this problem. If you ask why marijuana use went down through the 80s and then up through the mid 90s, I defy you to find a plausible explanation in policy. I can put on a chart two lines. One is the size of the cohort of I think it's 14 to 19 year olds and the prevalence of drug use in monitoring the future for 12th grade, and you'll hardly be able to see any light between them. There are broad demographic factors and fact cultural factors that drive a lot of these phenomena. And what you do with policy is going to have fairly modest effects on broad things like how many kids start using drugs. Doesn't mean one shouldn't try but you should not have an expectation that these are going to make large differences. The one kind of program for which you can make an exception, where you can say, we really do have some evidence that we can make a difference to substantial numbers, is treatment. Now, in part, it's because there was, until recently, so much hostility to drug treatment that treatment, the treatment community had to, under pressure from Congress in particular, do constant evaluations to show that they were able to make a difference in the lives both of the people they treated and the communities in which they operated. So crime is lower in Baltimore because there's been an expansion of drug treatment, a very large expansion of drug treatment in the case of Baltimore. That we can argue with pretty strong evidence. For everything else, you have impressions and contradictory evidence. If you ask me whether moving resources from federal prosecutors to local prosecutors is going to make a difference, neither I nor anybody else has any basis for a judgment on that. 
And I'm sorry that I, you know, that I sound unhelpful, but if you ask what is the empirical base for m these decisions, the answer is minimal. And that's why, oddly enough, treatment, you know, scorned and despised for so long, actually has something now to offer. It can provide some evidence that it makes a difference. Doesn't mean that enforcement can't make a difference, but it's really quite striking that in a period over during which enforcement has become greatly intensified as measured by the probability that a drug dealer, cocaine or heroin dealer, will go to prison. Over that period, cocaine and heroin, at least up till two years ago, I haven't seen more recent data, has seen decline, substantial declines in prices and almost no change in availability as measured by surveys. Um, that's gloomy statement, but it's a description of what we in fact have observed over a long period of time. Intensified enforcement and in terms of drug use, uh, minimal effects. Drug enforcement serves lots of purposes like making neighborhoods safer. And it's clear that enforcement, particularly local enforcement, aimed at, sort of I at neighborhoods has reduced the sort of disorder and crime around drug distribution. There's a lot more that goes on inside as opposed to outside. And Baltimore really stands out in sort of how that problem has not shrunk as much. In many cities, it has shrunk very substantially. So enforcement has a lot to show for itself. But if you ask by the indicators that are used, how, you know, what's the prevalence of drug use in the population, there's very little, there's, you know, there's nothing to suggest that tougher enforcement has made a difference. And if that's the measure that's going to be used, as it has been used in large part in the strategies, then enforcement is just not going to look very strong and these changes are not going to look, are not important. Let me make sure I'm clear on what you just said. Are you saying that treatment, treatment is the one thing that seems to have some effect on drug usage? I'm saying, yes, that is, there, there is a credible base of evidence systematically gathered that shows both that it reduces drug use and, which, and reduces crime and other adverse consequences for the community. Well, one it isn't to say that, if I might just say, yeah. it isn't to say that there's no such thing as an effective prevention program or that law enforcement makes no difference. But as a researcher, I can, I can fairly say, you know, it is an act of faith, an argument, not evidence, that tougher enforcement, in fact, reduces drug use in American cities. Well, I can tell you that um, in Baltimore, what we found, there came a time, a change of administrations, when our current mayor, to his credit, uh, Mr. Chairman, got drug dealers off the corners. Mm -hmm. And they just basically disappeared. Um, but then you go to other parts of the city and it seems as if they have been sort of, if, the, if you had a circle and they were all around <coughs> the circle and all inside, that they had been pushed to more or less the center of the circle and you didn't see them on the outside. And so, but yet and still, the crime continued, the problems continued. But one of the things that I do find, and I'm just listening to what you're saying, and then I want to hook it up with the ONDCP, is that when they, when, when, although the crime seemed to stay pretty steady, but there's a community in Baltimore that has successfully gone through treatment and it is truly a broad community. Uh, sometimes I go to speak before uh, people who have dealt with addiction and they talk about being clean for 10 years, five years or whatever. And it is a, it is a large community and one that help, they help each other. They, you mm -hmm. know, if one is a, so happens to end up to be a barber, they go to that barber. They'll end up in a certain church. And it's, it's, it's actually, and it's a very strong community. And um, it's just a shame that people have to go through that process to get there. And I guess what I'm going here is that, you know, so you're saying that no matter what we do, you don't see 
how we can attach success to any kind of enforcement. I, I, I want to be very careful about this. I, I want you to be. <laughs> right. The, the principal outcome measure that is used, and the chairman certainly uh, in his opening statement referred to this, the principal measure that has been used for the success of drug policy in this country is use, predominantly use in schools, but probably use in the household population. And I'm saying that there is no evidence in favor and a good deal of evidence that contradicts the proposition that tougher enforcement, and enforcement has by most measures, by most measures, gotten very much tougher over the course of the 90s, has had substantial effects on drug use. Um, I was looking at the, the marijuana chart over there uh, that was there. I mean, during the period in, of the 90s in which marijuana use amongst youth went up very substantially. Incarceration for drug selling offenses went up just as dramatically. And it, um, and, and marijuana possession arrests went up very substantially during that period, much faster than drug use amongst youth, drug, uh, uh, marijuana use amongst youth. Marijuana use amongst adults declined during that period. But, I mean, we have seen a, a very, persistent ratcheting up of enforcement over a long period of time and seeing pretty stable drug use in the general population. I think of enforcement as playing an absolutely critical role at the local level. And you know, there are lots of success stories there and you know, success stories that even research isn't going to, I mean, success stories are often stories people tell, but success stories that you know, when you go out and measure, they really did accomplish what they said they, they did. But if what you're after is reducing drug use in the general population, then tougher enforcement seems an implausible way of making a great deal of progress. And in Washington, in front of Congress, it's hard to say this, but policy is in many respects quite marginal. Thank you. Well, let me uh, say first, I appreciate your comments. Uh, as you're well aware from my earlier comments, we couldn't have a more comprehensive disagreement about what happened Absolutely. in the early days of the Clinton administration when you were advisor in the Clinton administration and an interpretation of those uh, results. I have to say, with all due fairness, I don't think I've ever agreed with Iran's study as, <laughs> uh, with, with uh, uh, narcotics, and, and I believe, um, but I believe that uh, that you do a very good job of articulating some of the key debate points and you've raised them around the budget and that doesn't mean just because I don't agree with all the conclusions that, that, that trying to go through this process and sort this through and the challenges you've raised. I think you, you raised a very critical point as we look at what even inside if we do uh, drug abuse prevention inside the prisons, uh, when we're locking up people and we federalize the enforcement questions, we're trying to go up the chain who are often the dealers, not the users, and therefore we need to look at, at where our uh, uh, dollars go for, for treatment. I thought that was a very insightful comment that I haven't really uh, heard in the debate. I think that um, uh, we can play a, a, uh, a, um, a couple of, of uh, um, what, Figures lie and liars figure here in, in, in how we cut the charts and how we treat lag effects. And oh, yeah. No, because, yes. because um, of course, when drug use goes up, arrests are going to go up. And then when the people become incarcerated, um, uh, they're not on the, the uh, they're not there using the drugs because they're in prison and they at least aren't counted the same. Therefore, drug abuse is going to go down. So how you treat a lag effect in the charts becomes critical. Um, that. Uh, but I would argue that, um, let me take you, take an interesting statistic. Sure. Um, t since we've kept divorce rates, divorce rates went down for two years under Calvin Coolidge, I believe one year early in the Eisenhower administration, under two or three years of Reagan, and they've gone down under Bush. So I if you elect a conservative Republican, divorce uh, rate goes down. Absolutely. Obviously, that's not true. Right. They, didn't, they didn't pass a policy because, as you said, the culture is really what drives it, not the public policy. The question, however, is how much does the signals that public officials send 
and the laws that they pass also have an interactive relationship in defining the culture. If you, in doing your research, presume that that isn't true, oh, no. um, or just say, look, this was a cultural change, and, and, and it's, it's a hard to measure change, which is driving which, but clearly there is a symbiotic relationship. And there is also, for every trend, a counter trend. Um, so that um, there's also a result that when incarcerations go up, the next generation sees, hey, I don't want to go to jail, and therefore they change their behavior. So you're not measuring, uh, you're measuring that as a cultural change about their attitude towards marijuana, when in fact it may have been an enforcement change with a delayed effect. Those are the types of difficulties as we go through these kind of numbers. Right. I, I mean, I, I appreciate that you've laid on the table about five uh, topics on which I give long talks, and I will not, not try to deal with all five of them, and certainly not at, at, at length. L let me just say a couple of, pick out a couple. Um, the, incarcer the effects of incarceration on measured drug use is, is, a, is a sort of intriguing topic. Um, I mean, the, the incarcerated population, us, I'm just sort of gonna give you a rough figure. I think probably there are 700,000 more drug users locked up now than there were in 1990. So just a rough, rough figure. And you say, well, um, if you talk about a few million, um, uh, if you talk about 2.5 million to 3 million cocaine users, which is uh, chronic cocaine users, which is sort of a, a conventional estimate now, and about a million heroin users, that's sort of three, three and a half million so of, of that, most of the 700,000 that are locked up as chronic drug users are using cocaine and heroin, it clearly has made a difference to the estimates. Even if you figure that in, it's still true that for heroin, the existing estimates suggest there has been a decline in the number of chronic heroin users. I mean, there's always been, for some years, there's been a concern that we are at the beginning of a heroin, new heroin epidemic because heroin is so much cheaper and more potent than it was certainly in the mid-'80s. And what's striking is there's just very little evidence. I mean, take that away. The evidence is that there's been very little initiation into, into heroin use. I mean, the problem is a problem of an aging cohort of people who used heroin and cocaine when they looked glamorous and they were popular. And certainly with co heroin, but almost as certainly with cocaine, there's been very little initiation. But isn't that almost a commercial for the fact that maybe our drug-free schools programs have had more of an impact than we thought. Maybe all the uh, arrests on TV have had more of an impact than we thought. Maybe the TV news stories showing people who have done a different, have had murders or blown up the Dawson family have had an impact and that maybe this is bad stuff um, and that it affected the culture attitude. How, how do you? Uh, no, um, fair, fair enough. The, the big declines in household use of cocaine occurred, you know, really in the mid-80s, and the, by 1985, certainly 1988, the, the use rates were way down. And most of the, the tough enforcement has really come after that. And I think it's a, it's a tough story to tell that somehow it was knowing that that tough enforcement was coming that led people in the mid-80s already to stop getting involved with cocaine. I think a much more reasonable story, epidemiologic story, is the reputation of cocaine changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the tragic deaths of Len Bias and Don Rogers probably had huge consequences. You can certainly see a, a sharp break in the monitoring of the future that's taken after their deaths. And cocaine, which had been a glamorous drug, and you know, famously Time magazine said some nice things about it in 1980, I think, or 82, it became seen as a as dangerous and um, as a dangerous drug, not no longer glamorous, even clearer with, with heroin. That it seems to me is much more plausibly what drove down the rates and has kept them down. I mean, they say cocaine and heroin have become very cheap by historic standards, dramatically cheaper than they used to be. They seem quite widely available. There has not been an upsurge in the use. It, neither of us can really make a you know, strong, empirically grounded, sort of micro empirically grounded case. But I would argue it's much more plausible. Well, I, I, I fundamentally agree with your point that those had 
a bigger impact, but I would argue it's a symbiotic relationship. I, I don't believe very many uh, cocaine addicts say, oh, I could go to prison, therefore I'm not going to do cocaine. But I believe it is a cultural effect of watching what happened with Len Bias, followed by then stronger laws on incarceration. Also because you did say that while it might not affect drug use, it makes the streets safer, which is in fact what the public is, that's what's behind much of the drug arrests. It's not about trying to help the individual. That's what we need to do more of in treatment. We don't have a real disagreement on treatment, prison yeah, reentry no. programs here, this type of thing. The question is, is that really the law enforcement part is to make the streets safer, to make people safer, uh, to, to try to break the chain of, of, of other people being exposed to it the first time by locking up the dealers. There's, there's other types of goals other than just getting a person off of, of drug abuse. But even in, I would argue that there's more of a symbiotic relationship. I wouldn't disagree on what the lead is. The lead is a cultural, the question is, what does public policy do to reinforce our-, our Could, could I be positive for one moment as uh, mostly uh, skeptical? Um, a, a close colleague of mine, Mark Kleiman, has for 15 years been arguing for um, a policy um, that I, I think is really still the cleverest idea of the last 15 years about drugs, which is, has the simple name of coerced abstinence. And the notion is simply that anybody on pretrial deten you know, re pretrial release, probation or parole, and we're talking about four and a half to five million people are in that condition, it may actually be higher now, be subject to regular monitoring of their drug use and graduated sanctions. Simply, you know, the first time you test positive, you know, you spend the afternoon in court, you, you know, watching what happens. The second time you spend two nights in jail, you know, the fourth time, what, you know, there's no, it's an idea which is sort of obviously reasonable. The few evaluations that have been done have been very positive about it. It's surprising how many people, given the right incentives, even if they have long careers of addiction, are able, with those incentives, isn't that what a drug court does? Well, drug, drug courts handle a small population. You hear about 1,600 drug courts. If you ask how many people are going through that system. Yeah, but now you're talking about the, the numbers. What I'm asking, isn't it a similar I mean, concept? I mean, drug courts are certainly in, but I mean, so. Isn't a, it a similar concept? It's a, simi it's a similar concept, but. The, but I mean, narrowly applied. Is it's more saying. narrowly applied. It, it can be much more routinized. The pretrial services agency in this city certainly did it for a while. And um, it is, I mean, you were talking about how to, in some sense, how to use the correction system both to reduce crime and reduce drug abuse. And this coerced abstinence, as I say, there's this very large population. If you do sort of estimates of what share of people who are chronic heroin and cocaine users are in this, one of these conditions, pretrial, release, probation, or parole, you know, it's, you know, about half or a third to a half of all cocaine and heroin is probably consumed by people in those states. And those are programs which are difficult to implement only because they sort of cross sectors of the criminal justice system. You know, probation and, um, uh, you know, probation has to then deal with corrections, has to deal with drug treatment and so on. And, and there's been sort of resistance, not because anyone's against the program, but just because it's difficult to implement. Um, at times, um, uh, certainly in, in, in the previous administration, there was some ritual endorsement of it, but it, it sort of has never taken off. And if I had to sort of say, do I have one thing to offer that I think congressional appropriators could pay attention to, I, I would say getting coerced abstinence, which has been tried more in Maryland than in any other state, uh, would really... Um, have the potential to make a, a difference uh, in a way that brings enforcement and treatment together in a constructive fashion. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, no, I don't have anything else, but uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your patience. It was a long afternoon. It was, but uh, it was a fast. I have to say, it was a fascinating exchange between you and Director Waltons. Thank you very much. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.
Tomorrow, the Democratic National Committee continues its winter meeting. Speakers include Senator John Edwards, Senate Leader Harry Reid, and House Leader Nancy Pelosi. Live coverage at 10 a.m. Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. Then, later in the day, President Bush speaks at a White House tribute.